<laughs> okay, uh, hello. Uh, welcome to the uh, final Berger seminar of 2021, our November seminar. Uh, I'm Nick Fry. I'm the curator of the John W. Berger III National Railroad Library. And currently, uh, this is going to be the first one we've done with uh, a live uh, uh, presenter in-house in the library. That's where we're operating from this morning or this afternoon. Uh, we have presenters here and we have presenters at their homes. And uh, we hope this is going to be a good day for everyone and enjoy it. Uh, our first presenter is uh, David Jump. Uh, Dave is the principal behind American Milling here in St. Louis. And uh, if you've been following the, the, the green uh, shipping situation here in St. Louis, American Milling's been a significant part of the infrastructure behind it uh, and the development of, of St. Louis's shipping capabilities. And Dave is also a serving board member on the Herman T. Pot Inland Waterways Board. Uh, and has uh, served on the uh, St. Louis Mercantile Library Board. So he's been uh, a big supporter of the work we do here in St. Louis at the Mercantile Library. Uh, and I think he's got an interesting presentation. I certainly enjoyed it uh, when we saw the practice today and I had some very, uh, very uh, uh, interesting questions I thought uh, that, that were brought up by this uh, discussion. So uh, without much further ado, uh, we're going to hand it over to Dave. One thing I do want to let everyone know, some folks, but this may be your first seminar. Uh, we do ask everyone to use the chat function in uh, Teams to ask questions. It keeps uh, people from talking over everyone. Uh, we will also probably mute uh, most microphones uh, just to make sure that we don't have any audio bleed over. Uh, and we also are going to be recording uh, all of the presentations today, we will be putting them online uh, via the Mercantile Library's YouTube channel. And traditionally, I will send everyone who attended or registered a link to the YouTube uh, videos when we're done. And we also put the links up on our uh, Facebook and other social media pages. So uh, I'm going to hand it off now to Dave and mute my microphone so I can sit back here and enjoy. And uh, I will also be relaying questions to Dave uh, throughout his presentation. So. Dave, jump, everyone. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So um, <clears throat> this is kind of a first for me, too. Um, and uh, I don't speak before groups often. Uh, generally, it's uh, grade school children, uh, high school students, or college students. <clears throat> but always, uh, they're, they're actually in the room. So uh, the way this normally goes is uh, whatever the subject is, I've usually got um, not that much prepared, <clears throat> maybe 10, 15 minutes or something. And then <clears throat> I let the, the questions kind of direct where the conversation goes because um, that way people are hearing about the things that they seem to be showing interest in hearing about. So uh, I think Nick's got some questions that he hasn't told me about yet. But um, all of you, please engage, and it will make this uh, easier for me and hopefully more interesting for you because I'm not getting an opportunity to read the faces to see um, uh, kind of uh, what I'm talking about that does you some good and what doesn't. So, <clears throat> so I've been asked to talk about the river system and uh, how it works in the grain business. And so with that in mind, <clears throat> so this is, this is a river system. And I don't know how well you could see it there, but basically, so we've got Minneapolis, uh, we're coming down the upper Mississippi River, here's St. Louis here. We get to Cairo, we go down into the lower Mississippi River, here is New Orleans, uh, here's Cairo, St. Louis, and then I'm gonna pick some rate points here to talk about, which are Peoria, um, Hennepin, uh, Davenport, and well, I'll probably go all the way to Minneapolis. So the way this works <clears throat> is you've got um, these different rate points. So that maybe I'll just draw this so it's a little easier. So you imagine this is sort of the, the western belly of Illinois that sticks out like this. And 
Cairo and the Ohio River going up that way and the Mississippi River going down that way. So we've got um, New Orleans down here. We've got uh, Cairo here. We've got St. Louis here. We've got um, Hennepin here. We've got Peoria here. We got Davenport here. And throw out there somewhere, we've got Minneapolis. So all of these uh, spots and, and many more, every spot on the whole river system has got, uh, let me just, we're not gonna do anything on the Missouri, but just for reference here. <clears throat> um, they've all got rate points. So for instance, Cairo is 3.80. St. Louis is 3.99. Am I blocking that? Can, you can see it, okay. <clears throat> um, Peoria is gonna be 4.81. Hennepin 5.07. Uh, that'll do as much over there. The Davenport is 5.32. I'll explain what all these mean in just a second. Minneapolis is uh, 6.19. So these have to do with the cost of shipping on a per ton basis loads, loaded barges to New Orleans from each of these points. And, so it makes sense that the further down the river system you get, the shorter the distance to New Orleans, the cheaper the rate structure. That's the easy part. Were you asking a question? Yes, is that dollars per ton? That's dollars per ton. Okay. <clears throat> sort of. <clears throat> okay. So then what happens is the way freight trades, so let's say that um, we'll just start with St. Louis because that's, that's the biggest uh, market of, of the bunch is freight uh, might be bid at 250% uh, and offered at uh, maybe 260%. Uh, so it used to trade years ago at 100%. So these really were the rates. But in today's marketplace, we don't get to 100% anymore. So when the, the, the rate to ship from, when the market is 200%, that just means that it's 3.99 times two. So we're at uh, actually at $7.98 per ton on that day if it's trading at 200%. If it's trading at 300%, 400%, 500%, you just multiply by each of these. So the same is true here in Peoria, if, or, or let's say Hennepin. If Hennepin's at, at 300%, it's times three. I actually wrote some of these down. So Hennepin at 300% is $15.21. You know, we're not using this. I'm going to use this. So it's, it's $15.21. The people that are in the grain business, they don't use the, uh, the per ton. They think in terms of bushels because that's the way grain trades. So if you're at $15.21 in Hennepin, Illinois, uh, uh, on, uh, yesterday on Friday, $15.21, yeah, I actually did my homework here, is, um, is 42.6 cents per bushel. So, <clears throat> so that's the way the setup so they're just figure there's just grain everywhere. There's a, lots of grain out here, uh, grain this way, grain, when you start to get too far east, generally doesn't go to the river, it more generally goes to the southeast. But the bulk of the Corn Belt works very well to the river system by truck or rail. Yes. Now these numbers are mainly for corn and soy and not wheat, is that correct? The same numbers would work for wheat, wheat's just not in the same place. The wheat that's getting exported <clears throat> is kind of out in there, Oklahoma, uh, northern Texas, Kansas, and is more of a, uh, Houston is more of the port for wheat. And I know you like railroads, that's moving by rail. Okay. Yeah. So that's how that, that's uh, BNSF, Union Pacific. Uh, KCS. Yeah. Oh, the, the, that's, that's not a river market. Um, but, but yes, this is corn and soybeans and, and the rates are all the same. Now, this is actually a corn number. 
And um, I don't know how much detail you want here, but, but basically the, 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 the weight of a bushel of soybeans is 60 pounds for calculation purposes. For corn, it's 56 pounds. So when you convert back to tons like this, this calculation is based off of 35.71 bushels per ton. So if I did my numbers right, that times that is $15.21. Okay. So <clears throat> are you the only one asking questions so far? So far. Okay. I, I have I have to let everybody know. I meant it on that question. I meant it on that question. The, 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 the grade school kids are always asking questions about it. All right, so, um, so then how does this actually trade? So, so what happens is um, you've got a group of people uh, in a room at places like uh, Cargill and Bungie and maybe American Milling, but uh, at the, 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 the grain companies, oh, did I go too far? Okay, okay. At the, the grain companies, They've got this exercise that they're doing all day long, consolidated grain bars, people that are, that are exporting grain. So at any moment, they know what grain's worth in the New Orleans market. So, so we'll just pick a number and let's say that's $5 per bushel. It's $5 per bushel. Okay, well then <clears throat> somebody is buying barge freight in that room. Somebody's job is to know what's the golf worth. Somebody's job is to know, and maybe the same somebody, what is the this barge freight worth? So they'll say, let's say they're sitting, they're thinking about St. Louis. So they're in St. Louis and they say, well, uh, barge freight today is worth 300%. So 300% is going to be uh, 33 and a half cents. Thirty-three and a half cents a bushel. So, um, <clears throat> so somebody in this office is on the phone with a train shipper out here somewhere. They're talking with um, people they're going to ship to them by truck. And in the St. Louis area, that truck dry area kind of kind of looks like uh, like that. So, and so they're having conversations, and and they're telling them what they're willing to pay for grain delivered to St. Louis in this case. Now, somebody in Peoria is doing the same exercise, Hennepin, same exercise. Each of these places, same exercise. He knows he's 33 and a half cents off of this. He backs that off <clears throat> from $5. And, uh, and then he figures he's got certain costs to handle. So he adds, you know, maybe another uh, minus another nickel and he gives him a bit. Now, um, I'm leaving out the Chicago Board of Trade part for the moment. We can come back to that, but this number isn't really $5 a bushel. It's moving around a lot uh, every day, moving uh, up uh, multiple cents, down multiple cents. <clears throat> and that's where the hedging part of this gets in. But in the, <clears throat> just in the basics, that's happening in St. Louis. That's happening in each of these points. You can be, you can find people sitting in, uh, you know, just obscure small elevators. They're all doing this exercise exactly the same way back to the point that matters to them. Now, as a general statement, uh, the, the corn is, is kind of, I'm running out of colors here. The, the, the corn is in the corn belt. So the corn is, is, is up, in, up in here, this coming to the river. So same's true for the beans. So the beans will work a little further south too. <clears throat> and, um, and, it, and it's all coming into this funnel. Now there's a lot of domestic consumption. In fact, there's a lot more domestic consumption than there is export consumption. But the domestic consumption is, is it is where it is and they've got to pay what they've got to pay. But in the case of export, they're all working off of the same method and the same basing point down, down here at the bottom. So, are there also comparable to these people in these elevators? Are there people in 
say Omaha, Fort Worth, and Kansas City, also looking at being flexible with the rates they provide as a rail shipper, or because of the way rail rates are structured, are they, do they not have the flexibility? Is this much more oriented to the barge and the truck shipper than the rail shipper? Well, uh, what, what I'm talking about is barge rates and, and you have every day, all day long, uh, buyers and sellers of barge freight, meaning users are generally the buyers and barge lines and barge management companies are the sellers. And there's, uh, no, no, I, I'm, I'm gonna say there's not really the same um, uh, ongoing price discovery that, that takes place when you're talking about rail freight. Now, does that tend to be like a long-term contract that you've already locked in with, <clears throat> with the railroad before the season started? Well, <laughs> I, I don't, I mean, I'm asking out of ignorance. I know you're asking, I know part of why you're asking is because you're a rail guy. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of a, more of a barge guy. Okay. So um, I, I'm, uh, I don't want to mislead you. I, I, the, the answer in a general way is <clears throat> you've got the Pacific Northwest market out here. You've got a lot of grain in this area here. The grain, and then I'm going to get to your question. The, the, the grain in, in this area here, um, <clears throat> as when barge freight is, is, is relatively low, when these numbers are 200 and 300%, though sometimes they get up to 500 and 600%, but <clears throat> when rates are pretty economical here, um, this grain is coming this way. When these river rates go up, the, the grain has, the same grain has a tendency to go this way. So these elevators, <clears throat> and this is not Fort Worth and some of those other places, this is more like Iowa and, uh, and Eastern Nebraska. <clears throat> they, um, they can go pretty easily either way with, with rail shipments of these, these larger train sets that we're shipping now. Now, sometimes those cars are private cars and that's one rate. Sometimes those cars are railroad cars that's a different rate <clears throat> and the, there's published rates and the discussions that they're having with um, the class one railroads that are moving this, I'm not in the room for those discussions. So um, <clears throat> uh, I'm not trying to dodge your oh, question, no, okay. I'm not that guy. Okay. <clears throat> Fair I, I, I feel the effects of those discussions, but, but I'm not the guy that's really in the middle of those discussions. Okay. Okay, so so there's a lot of um, sort of, uh, well, while we're on this, on the subject of, of going to the Pacific Northwest or coming to the river, the other big factor that matters is ocean freight. So imagine you're going to the Pacific Rim with a lot of this grain. That's not exclusively true, but a lot of the economics are driven by that. <clears throat> and there's a rate, an ocean rate, from New Orleans to Pacific Rim de destinations. And there's an ocean freight rate, which is always cheaper from the Pacific Northwest, Seattle, Tacoma, those, those ports up there um, to those same destinations. <clears throat> and um, barge freight is pretty cheap. I mean, you know, to be able to ship something uh, a thousand miles for uh, $10 a ton, is a, that's a pretty good deal. Um, while shipping by rail, that's not a bad deal, but that's just a more, it, it all adds up. And, and so there is this balance that goes on between the Gulf and the Pacific Northwest and where you see the effects of it are in this area out here where they're either shipping to the West or they're shipping to the East. So <clears throat> this, this really is sort of um, uh, Econ 101. That this actually works like freshman level economics. Uh, if, if, if the ocean freight uh, off of the Gulf is, is that spread versus, I mean, off the Pacific Northwest versus the Gulf, it is really at, relatively advantageous. This market is not going to receive as much grain. These barge freight rates are going to go down, not the fixed numbers, but you're going to drop from 300 to um, to, to 275 to 250 and and try to buy back that grain to get those loads. So 
every, and everything is constantly sort of um, resetting itself. It, it, it's one of those examples where capitalism actually creates very, very efficient results. And nobody is in a position where they can force things. So there's, there's, um, nobody can just hold their rates high and say, tough luck, that's what you got to pay because nobody needs them. Okay, so, um, all right, so, so that, that's that part. Um, the grain buying I talked about a little bit. Um, the, um, Nick, some of the questions you asked me before were about uh, kind of the evolution of the, 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 the rail traffic yeah. and, and where it goes in the grain business and why. And um, again, I'm going to leave wheat out of this for a moment. But um, so uh, I, I've been at this long enough that uh, we used to move stuff on uh, single car rates and then three car rates and then 15 car rates, 25 car rates. Then we got all the way up to 75 cars. And, uh, and, and now what's being done is train sets that are something like 110 plus. I uh, usually don't see them much bigger than 125 cars. And a lot of the grain that's moving now to the river is moving in these much larger units. And the railroads, um, they, they know their own efficiencies. And uh, this seems to be to work for them. Uh, and if you've got facilities that can load this in a matter of hours, and facilities that can unload units of size in a matter of hours. These train sets can cycle pretty fast. And this seems to be um, kind of a, it's like we finally got there. You know, the, the, in, in the, the, the grain business, I didn't see a lot of grain moving years ago like this. The 75 car units, that felt like it was really starting to make a difference. These bigger units here for corn and soybeans are, uh, it just seems like if you're not set up for that, um, you're, you're just not the one getting the primary business. Yes. So if you've got a train of 110 plus cars and it gets to a destination, the railroad's going to want those cars back in service as quickly as possible. So they're not going to- And the locomotives. The locomotives yeah. stay, it's a, they stay with them. So they want, they want to cycle that back into service as quickly as possible. So- can you do that kind of work just anywhere on the river? Because I would assume 110, 120. If you've got multiple trains like this coming in a day, you've got to have significant elevators to handle it and silos to handle it. But then you got to have enough barges on hand to keep the system fluid. So um, one thing here, you know, as you go further north, I noticed that there are plenty of locks on the Mississippi and that limits the tow side. Is there a spot that's the sweet spot for this kind of work, uh, this rail barge interface? And yes, this is a leading question based on our practice. Yeah, well, um, so the, uh, I think there is. Mm -hmm. so, so let me, um, uh, you also seem to be in, sort of interested in the history of how what used to be sweet spots and how those sweet spots change over time. So, so if you don't mind, I'll, I'll answer it that way. Yeah. How we, we're good on time, right? Oh, funny. All right. So, um, there's locks. Well, now I've thrown the other thing away, but, but when you get above St. Louis, you've got locks, um, on the Illinois river. And when you get past Hennepin, you really got kind of locks, locks, locks. When you get above uh, St. Louis on the upper Mississippi River, you've got uh, at Alton here, well, actually at, at Granite City, you've got Lock 27. Now they're not all exactly numbered right, some are out of service, but 27 locks. So that means you've got 27 pools or 25 or whatever it is today. And it's, it's not that easy, to, well, it's not easy, it's not difficult, but it takes a while to get through a lock and dam. And these locks up here and these locks up here a um, 15 barge tow is what moves on these locking rivers. Same thing's true on the Ohio up here. And um, you have to break the tow, except at the lowest locks, you have to break the tow into two pieces. It'll only take three barge lengths at a time. You got the first three barges up in, 
out, back, get the uh, lot, uh, barge length, barge length, boat, go through all of this. And you're only taking 15 barges. So the boat is sized for that, but this is, this is not a cheap thing to do. This is. It's not cheap, but boy, it's efficient. St. Louis to New Orleans, that's, and Cairo to New Orleans, that's kind of the super highway. So you can make a couple hundred miles a day doing that. While here, it's a function of who are you waiting on and, and what maintenance is going on and just the sheer time it takes to get through there. So, um, and you've generally got more water, more water depth. Uh, once you get St. Louis and South because you've been joined by the Missouri River here. So there were changes that evolved in river transportation, just like there were in what the railroads wanted to do. This is something that over the years, when you talk with the railroads, they say, we want to move grain like coal. And your, your railroad guys will know what I mean. That Coal for a long time has moved in large train sets same cars, same locomotive, cycling as fast as possible. Um, I don't mean speed. I mean, yeah. it, you know, it, it, it days, days of days of cycle. And, and so um, that's the way this, that's very similar to the way this grain now works. Well, in the river business, um, something that some really bright people did, uh, mostly in the early 90s, was they started building barges that were two feet taller which meant two feet deeper. So everything looks the same up top, but you can get an extra of something like 400 plus tons in that barge. But that barge should operate from St. Louis South because much of the time you don't have enough water depth in these uh, locking rivers to be able to load that barge as deep as you need to, to get that extra benefit. Um, so there, another thing that's happened is, is just generally the, um, there's not as much corn going export up in these areas. And that's because of ethanol. I'm not saying ethanol is a bad thing. It's just, it's just part of the evolution of all of this. So um, more and more, a, a larger and larger percentage of the grain that's going to export on the river is coming to St. Louis over the last, 20 years has continued increasing, yes. I have a question from the audience. Uh, Barbara is asking, is grain from train cars emptied into barges? And I think they're asking if it's directly into barges, if so, how is it unloaded at the destination site? So I think that's, is that coming up? I'll get you in a second, Barbara. Okay. We're not gonna forget that. So, um, so you ask about the sweet spot, and I'm just about there. So the, the sweet spot is, yes, St. Louis, is the spot where a lot of this grain um, that used to come from up in here and even out here to the upper Mississippi comes to St. Louis, the rate that we have a facility in Pekin, which is the Peoria area, and the spread, the cost of ship from Pekin to New Orleans versus St. Louis to New Orleans uh, 20 years ago was a difference of a couple dollars a ton. And now that difference is, is significantly more in most years than a couple dollars a ton. And, and much of that is because the St. Louis just works better. It's the bigger barges. It's, if you're now talking about when you ship from St. Louis South, it's not 15 barges in that tow. It's, it's 30, sometimes 35 barges, depending upon the boat, the river conditions. And, uh, and you just get a lot more efficiency. And the barge lines want to do it. And, and the way, again, it's Econ 100, the, the way the barge lines help induce this to happen is they charge rates that are commensurate with uh, them doing what works for them. So, so, the, so the answer to the sweet spot question, I think, is today, um, St. Louis, and I'm not talking about the whole grain market, but I, St. Louis is the spot where these large, these very large trains come. It's a spot where the, um, the, the interstates for the trucks really converge at St. Louis. And because of the bridges, you can pull from both sides of the river. And it's a place that the barge lines are able to ship with these 
big uh, barges and big boats and that they're the most efficient. So we have watched the percentage of grain barges that arrive in New Orleans that come from St. Louis over the last years, 20 years at least, have continued to increase, increase, increase. And a lot of capacity has been uh, added in the St. Louis market for the loading of those barges. And, and yes, part of your question, Nick, was where, and where can you get that many barges? St. Louis. You can get a lot of barges in places where the boats turn. And these big boats that are coming up to St. Louis, they don't go any further because that's where you start to hit locks. And so that's where they drop their toes. And those, those barges are either going to get now put into other toes to go up the river or they're going to load in St. Louis. The same thing happens in Cairo. There's just a lot more grain in St. Louis. So, so Barbara. Barbara wants to know how does it actually, yeah. how do you physically do this? Yes. Okay. So, um, and I have a question from Frank later on about grain ownership while it's in transit. Okay. But we'll take care of Well, we're, 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 we're not going to. Barbara got there first. Right. Barbara's first. And then so, we'll, so talk, we'll go with Frank's question. So, so let me. So, this is what a, uh, this is what a covered hopper car looks like. Um, Oh, am I blocking the, the camera? And then it's got lid up here, and these are hoppers, and it's got uh, you know wheels over here. And uh, this is actually the first grade version, but uh, I don't, Barbara may be a first grade. I don't know. So, uh, and then you've got a coupler out here, and a coupler out here, and you hook a whole bunch of those together. So these operate like funnels, and they've got gates on. So those gates are closed and uh, uh, this is a covered hopper car. So Barbara, you can Google a covered hopper car and there is, uh, they're trough loaded. So you've got the spout that, on the top and you move the car underneath it and load, 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 load. And then you go to the next one, the next one, the next one. When you get to the barge uh, loading facility, what you generally got is uh, here's your rail track. Somewhere in there, there's a, a pit with a conveyor that comes out the end, and that conveyor goes up out of the ground and out to the river. And there sits a barge to load and uh, another empty waiting to be loaded. And then there's a spout. So uh, the side view of that sort of looks in my block. Now. You're okay, all right. So you've got a, a, a barge sitting in the river like this with hatch openings. And you've got a tower that's driven down into the bottom of the river. And here's our water level here. And as that conveyor comes up and over the top, you've got a, um, an operator that sits kind of right here. And he can control this spout that uh, it, it, it go, it's telescopic. It swings up and down and it rotates around and he can put that, uh, that grain wherever he needs to in this barge. And then the barge moves down. You keep moving the barge down as you load it. And as you load the barge, you, you go into one end and it goes down like this. You keep moving, 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 comes down like that. And this back end usually comes up 18 to, uh, inch, 18 to 24 inches as you load it. It's done, it moves down. You swing your spout around and start right away in the next part. So when you get to New Orleans, what's the unloading process? Is there a conveyor that goes into the barge? Okay. Uh, at most facilities, uh, they use a marine leg, uh, but there, there's really kind of two ways to do it. So the, the, the other way is with a clamshell bucket. Okay. So this is, this is a crane, you know, that rotates like this, and it's got a big, enormous bucket that, that drops into the grain, pulls together, lifts up, swings back into a hopper, and you just go, go, go like that. And this is, this is really a big crane. 
The other way to do it is with a um, marine leg. I'll get rid of this. Good thing I got rid of that whole uh, river. Yeah, you do the real side. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, um, so the way a marine leg works is you've got a, um, a pulley, top and bottom. And then you've got a belt that goes around like that. And it's got buckets on it. And these, these buckets are shaped, the profile of them kind of looks like that. And another one, another one, another one, another one. And then you get up to the top. And as they go around the top, the top of the leg has got a shape like that. And the grain is thrown out down that spout. The empty buckets go back down again and they pick them up, pick them up, pick them up. And here's your barge. So these covers, that cover is lifted off. It's a fiberglass cover normally, and you can lift it off, set it aside, and then you've got this big marine leg and it's down in there and you can move it up and down and you move the barge down as it's digging, 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 scoop it, scoop it, scoop it, scoop it, scoop it. And then at some point you put uh, somebody in there with a, a bobcat or a front end loader that is then shoving to the end. And at the very end, um, uh, that operator is, is just dumping it into the bucket and you're out of there and go on to the next one. Okay. Who's my next? Your next one is Frank uh, Dewey, who has a question about this ownership of the grain chain. While it's on the barges moving down the rivers. Okay. Uh, uh, it, it can. I mean, basically, what happens is whatever a buyer and seller agree to. So, if, um, <clears throat> well, so the simplest version is uh, take a grain company like Cargill. Cargill, which is a great company, by the way. Let me give you a picture. They're all great companies, but, but Cargill or ADM or somebody that's got, uh, that's very vertically integrated is buying it at the grain elevator out here in you know, Pocahontas, Iowa and loading it into cars. So they, they own it. As soon as it, it's received at their elevator, they pay for it. They own it. They load it into rail cars. They ship it to uh, Peoria. They still own it. It goes through an ADM facility in this case, loads into uh, barges and goes down to an ADM facility in New Orleans. So this pretty much ADM all the way. They may even have a vessel charter that takes it to the other side of the world. And it's, it's ADM all the way until it's unloaded. Uh, that, that's the simplest version. In the, the trade, when multiple parties get involved with respect to the river, what generally happens <clears throat> is you load that barge. As soon as you load that, and as you're loading that barge, there is uh, a federally licensed grain inspector that is on site. Uh, that that uh, inspector is taking samples throughout the, the loading of the barge, as many samples as they want, as often as they want. And then they give you a grade certificate on that barge. You also have a weight on the barge. It's not always perfect, but you can settle that up later. And it's possible and very common to uh, load a barge. And when you have the grade certificate and you've got the weight and you've got a bill of lading from the barge line to sell that barge and be paid for. It. And, and that's a very common thing to do. Those documents hit the bank of the, the customer that's buying that, that barge load of grain and it's paid for by wire transfer normally the next business day, if you get all the documents to them by a certain cutoff. And at that point, that grain is owned by the buyer uh, and, and until he sells it to the next person. Now, um, you can have, um, you can load barges and not sell them. You know, you can load barges and, and if you choose, uh, you, you can wait until they hit the, um, uh, the Baton Rouge and say, hey, I've got uh, four float barges in this tow. And that's something that you might do if you believe 
that there is such an appetite in the nearby spot market that someone will pay a premium for a barge that, that they need to make a ship. That's a, a level of speculation that where I work, we really don't get into that. But, but, but yes, you can do it that way. I can see where you could get stuck out on a limb like that if all of a sudden you get to New Orleans. Then. But we're good right now. Well, they're never good, good. It, it's just, you may not, um, yeah, you, you can get beat up, but it's yeah. just gonna be a few cents, uh, a bushel or something. Um, the, um, to a degree, the, the New Orleans market for grain is a black hole. It's a function of price, but, but I, it, it doesn't really happen that, um, oh, they, they're just, I got, we're sending barges down in New Orleans and uh, what if they don't need them? They're never full. Sometimes it gets backed up. And, and again, this is the whole price discovery thing where, where um, if that market gets cheap enough, um, then buyers are moving off the Pacific Northwest. And it's, and it's not just the Pacific Rim that they're shipping to, they're shipping to all different parts of the world. But again, the most common thing uh, at least in the part of the market that we're in, is not to bet that the price is going to be higher or lower. It's it's not to bet. It's to, to lock in a margin. So day after day after day, you're you're. What's the barge freight? What's the Gulf worth? What's it cost to get there? How much of a margin can I make to cover the cost of answering Barbara's question about uh, the the loading of the barges and any any risk that you might have and paying your employees and all these sorts of things. Um, that's more the business that, that I'm familiar with. And Barbara says, thank you. That explains the conveyor belt she sees along the river. It, 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 do we know where Barbara is? Uh, we can. Uh, well, I can tell her where the secret is. I'm in St. Louis. She's in St. Louis. Great. All right. Barbara. Barbara. So uh, when you are on Interstate 55 and you are south of the Anheuser-Busch Brewery, as you look over into Illinois, you will see lots and lots of conveyor belts. That's where this happens that I'm talking about. That's where the large trains happen. They happen at other places in St. Louis, but in terms of a concentrated area, there's about two miles there, again, on the Illinois side. Or if you don't, maybe you shouldn't be looking out the window while you're going up the interstate, but you can go to Google Earth or something. But, but this is, that's the area of concentration where this happens in a big way. And truthfully, if you want to just go over there and drive around, there's so much activity, nobody will know enough to kick you out of here. So just uh, make yourself know. Thank you. But please respect private property. Yeah, but, but I mean, any place that's got got two thousand truck drivers a day coming, you you'll you'll be fine. Okay. Um, okay. Does anyone else have any more questions for Dave? We're about uh, forty five minutes in the first uh, hour or so. Let me give you a little teaser. Okay. All right. <clears throat> a complication that I didn't get into before. I didn't know if we'd have enough time for is the uh, grain futures element. So when I said this doesn't really just sit there at $5, what happens is <clears throat> at the Chicago Board of Trade, which is now part of the Chicago Merc Mercantile Exchange, you've got uh, delivery months in corn and in soybeans. And, <clears throat> and then you've got, so it, this conversation that I described is all happening like it's, well, what are you doing today for grain to ship today? That's not actually what happens. What happens is somebody calls any one of these places and they want to sell grain. And they say, well, I'm, I'm bidding uh, $4.62. This is an example. If it comes in today, oh, well, what do you pay for next month? Oh, next month. Well, next month I'm willing to pay uh, $4.67. Oh, okay. Well, that's nice to know. Uh, what are you doing for January? Well, for January, I am $4.78. And, and that's always the way it is, is that the, 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 not necessarily what's almost always uh, worth more and more and more, or all the grain comes immediately. 
and that's called an inverse, but this is called a carry. And to have a carry in the market is why it makes sense to have grain bins. And stuff is grown once a year. And if it wasn't worth more in the future than what it's worth today, all this grain would come to the market as fast as it possibly could. Doing that would drive down and does drive down the nearby market. Now, the opposite of a carry is an inverse. It happens, but, but inverses are not the general rule. So, um, so this is determined by the Chicago Board of Trade futures market and the cash market has got what's called a basis. So that if the if futures are $5.10 and, and St. Louis is 20 under, that means, well, what it's under is barge freight. The barge freight differential minus their, their handling margin is what the, the differential is below New Orleans. But, but in, in Chicago, if you're $5.10 a bushel, and well, we're at 20 under today, you could be at 20 under all day, while this number bounced around up two cents, five cents, down three cents, and still tell somebody we're at two cents, three cents under. So um, I'm not sure I did anything but confuse anybody with that, but, but, but let, let's just go with this carry. So there's a carry. So when I say corn's worth in this example, $5 a bushel here, yeah, but it's worth, it's worth 510 next month and it's worth 523 uh, months from now and it's worth 540. So, so people are not just making decisions about where's the best place for me to go, but they're also making decisions about when's the best time to ship it. And that's how the grain market sort of spreads itself out so that the demand is not three months a year. Even though the production is come, all comes out in six, eight weeks of the year, the demand is, is year long. And so the supply matches that, but it only matches it because there's this carry in the market in most years. And if the grain market says, Ooh, I need, like you said, you know, I, I got 10 ships that are gonna be loading in the next 12 days down here and I need to go get it, get it, get it. This number goes up, up, up. And you might even have an inverse. You might call the guy, that you've got grain bought from for next month to say, hey, could you bring it in now? I'll pay you that price plus a couple cents. And, uh, and that's the way a lot of the supply and demand gets really leveled out is through these, these forward uh, pricing mechanisms. And I would also guess then as the harvest season for the, okay, so you got everything in storage that's gradually being drawn down throughout the course of a year. As the next harvest is coming, bearing down on, on, on us, Prices start falling because they want to empty out the silos so they're not just going to let that corn and soybeans rot in the fields, or is it sometimes worth not putting it into the, to the market? Uh, you would make a really good trainee in this, this business. Nick. Those, are, th those are good questions. That is a delicate moment uh, every year. Sometimes the crop that's coming on uh, isn't that big. Yeah. Sometimes there's an issue. Sometimes the demand for ethanol is very strong. The demand for feed is very, very strong and there's not that much left for export. And you may, sometimes there's a quality issue. You may wanna hang on to some of that really, really good stuff um, because you're concerned about the quality that's gonna be coming out of the field. But um, yeah, in, in the grade school version of this, what you're saying is correct. Carry, new crop, carry, new crop. That's, there's a logic to that, but on a year to year basis, what actually happens is uh, many times messier than that. Your results may vary. Yeah, that's exactly right. Okay. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Oh, here we go. Frank has another question. Does New Orleans typically ship grain to South America while Baltimore ships to Europe and LA or in the Pacific Northwest ships to China, or are they all, all these ports around the country competing with each other for similar destinations? So like are the East Coast ports competing with the Gulf and the West Coast and vice versa? Yeah, so the, the Pacific Northwest ships to the Pacific Rim, and as far as I know, no place else. The idea of going backwards through the Panama Canal, that's okay. not gonna happen. Yeah. Um, 
shipping to South America is unusual because uh, Argentina and Brazil now are major producers of corn and soybeans. The largest exporter in the world, I think this year of soybeans is not the United States, it's Brazil. So, so to ship to South America, uh, that would be pretty uncommon. But yes, um, to the Atlantic, um, which must be over here somewhere, to the Atlantic, uh, that's going to be hit out of the Gulf. Um, many years ago, it would, some of that would come out of the Great Lakes. Um, that's pretty uncommon for grain to ship off of the, there you are, Frank, for grain to ship off of the East Coast is not unheard of, but it's uncommon. It, 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 grain, in a general way, and any grain trader knows this isn't totally true, Grain's worth more as you go east. The further east you go, the more it's, the higher the cost is. And when you get out of the corn belt, that really happens. So you can find a cornfield in Pennsylvania, but it's it's for, for dairy cattle, it's for, for chickens in the Delmarva Peninsula. It, it's not for export. Right? So uh, the idea of coming from the Midwest to, to export is uh, off the East Coast is extremely uncommon. The other thing, I know you, you've got a railroad crowd out there. And Frank is a railroad guy. He's, so, one of my, he's a retired CSX vice president, so. All right, well, really, all right, well, Frank, I mean, you know, there, you got UP and BNSF and you got CSX and Norfolk Southern. And so, um, do you really think this grain out here in the UP and the BNSF is gonna make it over over break over Chicago or break over St. Louis and, and get on out to the East Coast. I don't think so. I don't see that very often. So you're talking about Eastern grain that's gonna need to get there. And you've got so many chickens and hogs and dairy in, in the Carolinas and in the uh, upstate New York and Pennsylvania area that, that to, to break through that from a cost from a value standpoint for, for grain to wind up on the East Coast, um, it's not that much more expensive to ship the ocean freight, to ship from New Orleans to um, the Mediterranean than it is to ship from, from Baltimore. So part of this, Frank, it, Frank and I both have experience with what Baltimore's grain shipping infrastructure used to be in Maryland. And in fact, my brother used to live in a reconditioned silo complex that was a railroad owned grain silo in Baltimore, it was massive. That market is essentially all gone. Anything that's going out now is going out of New Orleans. Uh, it, that's pretty much what you're saying here. This, that that, that would be an point. epic change at this point for, for that to go the other way. Yeah. You just got, this is, you got a lot of people over here on the right coast and the left coast, but but these east coast uh, consumptive demand is um, really drives a market for uh, animal protein, chickens, hogs, uh, and, and dairy cattle in, in different parts. That um, the eastern corn belt, which doesn't produce anywhere near as much as Illinois, Iowa, eastern Nebraska, that eastern corn belt sometimes goes export, but, but for the, and it does, when it happens, it goes out in the world. But to actually move east, it is to hit those uh, livestock feeding operations. It never, never makes it to the coastline before it's consumed. Never is a long time, but, but uh, it tends to. It, it's, uh, it's something, something strange in the neighborhood when that's going on. Okay. Uh, Anybody have any more questions? We're about at an hour for Dave. I didn't think there would be that much interest. Hey. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe it's just me talking. That's a hip crowd. Okay. Well, hello to my grandkids, my mom. Uh, I know you're up. Uh, all right. Uh, well, Dave, thank you so much for okay. giving us part of your Saturday today to join us. Um, and uh, Barbara says thank you. Uh, if you do have questions, we do have. I'll see, uh, see you in Cahokia sometime, Barbara. Uh, if, if you do have questions uh, that you think of later on, you can contact me at the library and I can pass one to Dave. Uh, uh, or uh, Sarah Hodge is here, who's been helping out with the presentation. She's our Waterway creator. 
either one of us can help you out uh, with uh, either looking up the answer here at our fine waterways and railroad libraries or getting in contact with Dave. Uh, and, uh, you know, our rule of thumb here is if we don't know the answer, we know who to ask or where to look it up. So I should have used the stick. Oh, yeah. Maybe next time. Next time. Next time. All right. Um, let me uh, switch over here. We're going to go back to my camera. Okay. All right. And okay, uh, our next presenter is Father Thomas Keller. Uh, and uh, Father Tom, uh, he, he just, I, I met him this year uh, when he was doing research with Sarah on the Wiggins Ferry Company. And I have to admit, I'm currently working on a project involving Wiggins Ferry tangentially for the Ohio and Mississippi Railroad. Uh, here uh, uh, in St. Louis for the BNO Railroad Historical Society. So I perked up when, when Father Tom uh, mentioned his topic. And uh, he's been here a few times at the library. And in the course of this, we, we talked to him about joining us today to talk about his research. And I think you're going to find this interesting. Wiggins Ferry is probably one of the most interesting waterways transportation companies you may have never heard of and has such a long uh, historical impact for its size that uh, it is fascinating. So I'm going to hand it off now to Father Tom and I'm gonna pin you now. I think you are, no, not yet. Let me make you the co-host. Okay. Nope, that's not working now either. I'm here if you can hear me. Oh, Father Tom, you're muted too. No, oh, I gotta stop that. Oh, I shouldn't be muted. Let me try this. I am here if you can hear me. We can hear. Can you hear me? I can, can we hear. Can you, uh... I can hear Tom. <laughs> okay, we can hear Tom. There we go. Okay, I'm not sure if my screen is up though. It's up. Say we see. I see you, Tom. Okay, on All the right. main screen? Yep, you are good. Oh, okay. Well. Um, thanks. That was a great introduction because uh, maybe the that's a good description of the Wiggins Ferry Company. Maybe the most important and most influential um, steamboat company you've probably never heard of. That I like that description, and and certainly want to be great. I am certainly grateful to the Mercantile Library, to Sarah and to Nick for uh, helping me with some research. I'm going to share a screen if uh, if I can do that. Let's do that. How about that? Is that brought that up to everybody? You are good. Yeah, we're seeing the screen. The old monopoly. That was the nickname that it was given, at least in the uh, newspapers, uh, before the uh, the Eads Bridge. You have to ask yourself, how did people get across the river before that old, before that big Eads Bridge? First, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm a Catholic priest, um, priest of the Archdiocese of St. Louis, ordained in '97. Uh, I've had a number of assignments in the Archdiocese. I'm currently the pastor of Assumption Parish in South County, sometimes known as Assumption Matisse. Matisse must have been a place at one time, and it's not anymore. We're just part of South County. Uh, we're right near Concord, uh, which is still kind of a place, but not much. Um, I've been interested in uh, Western River history since childhood. There's a great uh, story that I, I can't give you all uh, uh, the whole story because it uh, takes a little long, but in the end, I uh, uh, stowed away when I was about 12 years old with my parents uh, on the Mississippi Queen, which used to be a uh, uh, a big cruise ship steamboat on the Mississippi, and uh, it was easy to stow away. So we next year we did the Delta Queen, and we we did that for a number of years till they started expecting us to get on the boat at that time, and uh, all had to do with getting on the boat um, uh, down at the Bus and Quarry. Uh, area, uh, they would let VIP folks on and uh, uh, take them downtown on the 4th of July for what they called the Great Steamboat Race. 
And uh, when they let VIP people on, we just snuck right on with them. And uh, that's uh, kind of how it all started. I, I love to build things. And so I build model steamboats. I've been building model steamboats since I was a kid. Uh, that's a couple of them right there, three of them. I've certainly built more of them over the years than that. I build them from scratch. Um, there's no plans because generally there are no plans for those boats. There's a few naval architects who've kind of rendered what uh, rendered some plans, and there are a few that uh, have survived from maybe the Howard um, Howard uh, uh, steamboat yards and in Jeffersonville, Indiana. But for the most part, there just aren't any. So I use photographs. Uh, I look at photographs of steamboats all the time in order to see the details and try to get perspective and try to get the size of things right. And so uh, if I'm not doing pastoral work stuff or family stuff, I'm usually uh, working away in a little room in the rectory I call the boat yard. And I've got a couple of different boat projects going on at a time right now. Um, and so, like I said, you got to look at photographs, lots of photographs. Now, these aren't particularly good photographs to build a steamboat on uh, from, but they are um, different views of our downtown uh, levee, St. Louis uh, levee riverfront. Um, and it's did three different periods in history, but um, as you're looking at these boats, usually you're looking at the big packet boats or the excursion boats and you're saying, oh, look at those, you know, big uh, ornate boats or whatever. But what you don't realize is that in each one of those photographs, there are ferry boats just in the distance and you almost never notice them. They're always Wiggins ferries. If it's, a, if it's, if it's an image of downtown St. Louis, um, it is always a Wiggins Ferry. They had a monopoly there. I don't know if you can see on the big picture on the left, there's two boats out in the river. Both of those are Wiggins Ferries. One is a wagon ferry, and uh, then the one further back is, is, a, is, a, is a train transfer or a car transfer ferry. On the right, you can see the president under construction, probably. So that makes that about night about 1932 or 33 or so, probably late 32. And in the background behind that is a boat called the Julius S. Walsh. That's uh, the last of the Wiggins ferries, and it's probably abandoned at that point, but it's there. Um, and then down at the bottom is a yet another Wiggins ferry. Um, I'm not sure which one that is, but uh, uh, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't be anything but that there. Um, talking about the Julius S. Walsh, I was building, the reason why I got into the Wiggins Ferry Company history is because during the lockdown, right, two weeks to, sl uh, to slow the spread, remember that? I thought, well, I'll build a boat, a little simple boat, and I'll say I built that during the two weeks to stop the spread. Well, it took longer than that, and I knew it would, but I, I got it started during those two weeks. Uh, and that's the last of these Wiggins ferries. That's like the 40-something boat that they built. Uh, and, and, and that's incredible if you think about a steamboat company. The average steamboat company in uh, uh, any, any, at any point in the, in the history of the river was generally just a one-boat operation. Some of these lines, the Lee line, the anchor line, Diamond Joe line, maybe they were running four boats at a time, or maybe sometimes a few more or a few less, uh, but one or two, three or four, a six boat um, operation is a huge, huge operation on the river. And there are very few steamboat companies that probably ever got to that many. But the Wiggins company was operating, you know, four, five, six, seven boats at, at a time, uh, and successively year after year, decade after decade for um, all, for hundred for for all, about a hundred years. Uh, that's a pretty amazing feat. And also, if you think about it, if you're from St. Louis, you just never think about ferries in St. Louis. You just don't. Do you think about crossing the river? You think about that Eads Bridge. Somebody hated that company and didn't want them around when they were gone. You wanted to forget them once they were gone. Uh, as I researched this, this company, I, I found out, well, you know, um, it's, it's, it's been around a long time and there's a lot of neat stories connected to it. I can't tell you all the stories and the time I got, but we could just talk about its chronological narrative. It starts in 18, 
I'm sorry, 1795 or so. And it's still there just barely with the ferries kind of rotten on the levee by, by 1930. That's a really long time for any company, much less uh, uh, a company on the Mississippi, which tended not to be a long lasting um, enterprise, usually as long as a boat or two lasted and then the captain either made enough money to retire or he, he was broke because it didn't work and he never came back. Um, we could talk about, and this is a really interesting topic, about something called Bloody Island, which used to be uh, right in the middle of the river, right in front of St. Louis, and it threatened to uh, uh, cut St. Louis off from the river, and the river would have went straight down what's now, um, it would have cut a new channel straight through what's now East St. Louis, and St. Louis would have lost its influence because it wouldn't be in the right spot anymore and all the infrastructure would be too far from the river. Um, maybe it could have rebounded by building in a new spot. Maybe it just would have been like, you know, all some other, the, uh, other of these towns that just it wouldn't have thrived. Maybe Alton would be the main city in the area. We don't know. Um, but Bloody Island is um, connected to the Illinois mainland because of a guy named Robert E. Lee. Uh, Robert E. Lee, uh, uh, but who paid to who paid to build the dikes and the wing dams and everything? Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, because the federal government wouldn't pay. Missouri couldn't get their act together to pay. Illinois didn't want to pay, so <laughs> Wiggins paid to connect Bloody Island to the to the to, to the uh, mainland mainland of Illinois, and, and it was advantageous for them to do that. We can certainly talk about all the ferries they ran during the golden age of steamboating. And one of their ferries became a, an ironclad and, and was involved with uh, action in the Civil War down in the South. Uh, but uh, there's a lot of stories about individual boats. One of them blows up right there on the levee. And um, we could talk about a bunch of things. We could talk about the, the Great Flood of 1844, which makes our the memory of our of our 19 uh, uh, 1993 flood look like nothing. We always think that was the biggest, but it was not anywhere close. The one in 1844 was bigger. We really could talk and be really interesting to talk more about the monopoly that that existed. And we'll talk a little bit about it uh, and the competition, um, which often they would run off with with carrying guns and stuff. They would go barging into the offices of competition and seize their property. Um, and uh, so the Wiggins people, they, they didn't take prisoners, so to speak, um, because most of them were super powerful people. They were, the, 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 they were not steamboat people. The Wiggins Ferry Company was not steamboat people. It was powerful politicians, powerful bankers, um, powerful investors, real estate people. Uh, that's what made up the board of directors. They rarely had a steamboat person do anything other than the general operations of the, of the company. Uh, and uh, later when the railroads became uh, uh, powerful, railroad people were on the, on the ferry company board. Um, and of course, there's the great story between Wiggins and the bridges, the Eads Bridge, Merchants Bridge, and eventually the Free Bridge that became what, what we call what the, the, the uh, MacArthur Bridge, is that right? Um, uh, that was a huge threat to the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, and, and, and obviously, the bridges are going to win in the end, but not the way that anybody thought they were. What we're going to talk a little bit more about is just simply that transition from ferry to rail um, and, uh, and, and how the ferry boats adapted to, or the Wiggins company adapted to the phenomenon of, of, of railroading to, 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 uh, to the West. Um, while we're at it, though, we want to talk a little bit about the kinds of of ferries that you'd encounter, and we'll talk about them more as we go along. One is a passenger ferry. There are very few passenger ferries on the Mississippi River, not important to get people across the river as it is freight. Um, but there is, there are, there are, you know, folks that would have to get from one place to the other. 
Um, up that top picture is one of the few passenger ferries that uh, Wiggins ever operated. And of course, they operated it directly against the Eads Bridge. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, the middle photo is a wagon ferry, if you can see that. That's a great big wide deck with a small, small superstructure that actually covers the engines, the boilers, and the paddle wheel, which are in the middle of the boat. We'll, we'll, we'll see that a little closer a little later. And they would just roll wagons right on one side and right off the other, similar to the way we would, would see that happen today on, on automobile ferries. Uh, but in addition to wagons, the Wiggins folks had an army of, folk, of, of, of laborers who would um, also be loading freight on those boats. Um, and so the wagon ferry or later the automobile ferry, that was a, a major part of their business. And then ultimately we see these railroad transfer boats, large steamboats um, with a opening right down the center of it. The boilers are pushed to the side, the wheels are pushed to the side, engine, engines are to the, and then right in the center are those, are those tracks right down the middle of the boat. And the, the trains can uh, roll right on and roll right off, essentially. Um, the way they back right on and then pull right off. Um, and uh, 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 there'll be quite a few of those in the Wiggins history also, as well as um, barges that served the same purpose. And then they were pushed either by tugboats or towboats. Um, so those transfers. Transfers are sometimes called car ferries. We'll see that in a minute. Let's take a look closer look at the wagon ferries. That's a closer picture. Hopefully you can see it. Um, Eads Bridge is already built in that photo, and you can see the Great Eagle Line in the background. Uh, those two, uh, three big boats there, two of them, the two that are most visible are part of the Eagle Line. That's where their docks were, or wharf boat was on the opposite side of the river there. The river, the, the, the ferry is the Alonzo Church, um, and uh, he was a lawyer for the company, and we'll see that lawyers play a big role in the in the, in the Wiggins story. These um, wagon ferries have a U-shaped hull. It would ma make more sense to me if they were like a catamaran, like a pontoon boat, but they were U-shaped. They, they were the pointy part, I guess, in the front, and then the hull would split into two, uh, and the paddle wheel would be in the middle between the two sides of the hull, and then above it would be the boilers, the engines, or in between the two sides, be the boilers, the engines, the paddle wheel, all be kind of encased between the two sides there. Typically the, the Wiggins and many of the other wagon ferries, they only had one smokestack and they're kind of ungainly pointed to one or laying to one side or the other of the, of the pilot house. Um, the graceful double smokestacks that you think of with a steamboat don't really, um, don't really, uh, you don't really find them on these wagon ferries. Um, and then, as I said, it's, it's meant to transport some passengers. The passengers would be up on that second deck and the freight would be down, the wagons and the horses would all be down on that first deck. This is a really old um, uh, steamboat, uh, probably maybe the St. Clair or the Ibex, probably one of those boats, one of the very first steamboats that uh, Wiggins owned. Uh, but you can actually see the artist uh, is showing the wagons are coming on and the wagons are coming off all at once there. And there's that ungainly smokestack that's still back in those days. It's 1832. That's a great photo. Shows also the more primitive design of the steamboats too, only two decks tall. You can see the old cathedral in the background. I'm interested in that. And probably there's a couple of other domes and steeples. One of those has to be the low, maybe, uh, maybe the old, the old courthouse under construction, I guess. I'm not sure. Um, another picture just to show you the, the way those boats uh, would come up to a wharf boat with two great big stages that would go ashore. And then you'd have to get the horses and wagons over those stages. Um, and that's pretty typical. The Wiggins uh, 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 company had a number of docks like that up and down both the Illinois side and the uh, Missouri side. And then we look at the train, those railroad transfers a little bit more closely. 
Uh, I want to point out that the railroad transfers worked all the way from the 1860s on the river until the 1960s. We have a century of, of active rail transfers. The last ones were big ones built in Dubuque. Um, you think of the Albatross, which becomes the Admiral. That's how big those, those uh, rail uh, transfers were getting towards the end. And then the Pelican is a, a, a similar boat to the Albatross. St. Genevieve's not built in Dubuque, but it's similar size. And uh, the, both the Pelican and the St. Genevieve, they're working until the 1960s. Um, Pelican down in Vicksburg, uh, and then later in Helena, Arkansas, and the St. Genevieve, it's uh, a part of the St. Ge St. Genevieve um, area there. Um, and then there's the BF Yoakum, Yoakum, I guess. It was in Baton Rouge. It became, it was renamed the Willard V. King. And it came to St. Louis and uh, moved Missouri Pacific uh, all the way until 1940. And that was the last railroad transfer uh, in St. Louis. It's not a, it's not a, 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 a Wiggins boat. Um, Missouri Pacific never never crossed the river on on uh, on Wiggins ferries. We'll see that they're they're direct competitors and one of the few direct competitors that they didn't find a way to suck in. Um, let's just do some background, right? Remember, the Mississippi represents a north south highway. People are going up and down it first on flat boats, then on uh, uh, keel boats, and then on steamboats. Um, we get to, uh, to 1764, uh, the founding of St. Louis, and people need to cross the river east-west, uh, but that's a formidable barrier. You just can't do that if you don't have a boat. Your wagon is not going to make it across the Mississippi. You're not going to be able to swim across the Mississippi there. Um, and so it's a formidable barrier. Someone ha with a boat has to get you to cross, get, get you across that river, and that's really the beginning uh, of this ferry company. Now, in addition to just folks who want to travel west, the 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 Southern Illinois floodplain across the from the from St. Louis has been and continues to be an extremely fertile. Um, agricultural center. It's known as the American bottom. We don't ever use that word in St. Louis anymore, but you see it all the time when you're reading about Wiggins, about the American bottom. And that's representing uh, all the farmers. And also there's coal that's found in Belleville. Believe it or not, a Trappist monk found coal in Belleville, uh, probably uh, in the late 1700s, 1700s uh, when the Trappists were right there near, Monk, near Monk's Mound in the Cahokia Mounds. And when they found coal, eventually that coal is going to become an important part of the steamboat um, industry. Uh, but for the time being, if you wanted to, sh to move anything across the river, farmers, shippers, travelers, settlers, you're going to need a boat to cross the river, so you're going to need a ferry. The guy who starts the first ferry is a guy named James Piggott. Well, there's maybe a guy before that named Gamash, but Piggott's the first guy who um, really starts the, the ferry company, a ferry service. He's a, a captain, not like a steamboat captain. He's before steamboats, not even a bo boat captain. He's a captain in, in the Revolutionary War. He fought with General Washington at Brandywine and Saratoga. Then he's part of a, of a post-war project to fortify the Western frontier. And he builds forts basically in the Columbia, Illinois area, right across from the Jefferson Barracks Bridge here in St. Louis. He settles in the Mer American bottom, builds those fortifications, but he eyes St. Louis and he realizes that it would be profitable to build a ferry service um, to connect the American bottom to St. Louis. Uh, and um, let's see, there we go. Uh, in, eight, in 1795, uh, he begins, um, uh, let me see, he begins, he begins uh, a process of getting authorization from the Spanish governor and the Illinois legislature, which is just being formed about that time to uh, operate a ferry in St. Louis. Uh, 
between 1795 and 97, he has to build the infrastructure because you can't actually get to where we call East St. Louis today. It's just 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 woodland. So he has to build the, the roads. He has to build a bridge over the Cahokia Creek. Uh, he has to build, he has to, to clear the landing. He has to build support buildings. So it takes a few years. In, nine, in, in 1797, he starts the ferry service, but they're basically just canoes with pirogues there. Canoes, maybe two of them tied together with a platform uh, between the two. You'd have to take apart a wagon. If you wanted to cross the river with a wagon, you'd have to take the wagon wheels off, the freight off, put the wagon on the on the ferry, which again is just two, two big canoes with a platform on it. They cross it, they come back to pick up your wheels and your freight or whatever, take it across, come back and take the horses. And then finally, if there's room for you somewhere, you get to go on the, uh, on the ferry. So you would have to pay to cross, pay the ferry to cross three or four times just to get you and your, your wagon across the river in those days. And it, the river was really narrow at that time and, and fairly deep. Uh, and you could actually just holler from one side of the river and uh, the ferryman would know to come over and get you. Uh, so um, uh, the river's different now than it was then. And, and, and we'll, we could kind of go into that more deeply, but probably don't have time. Uh, the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, we have to see where the name Wiggins comes from. Piggott doesn't run the company long. He dies two years later in 99. And then, it's, then it, it passes from one operator to another, uh, basically leased by the Piggott family. The Piggott, uh, Piggott widow, Mrs., Mrs. Piggott, wasn't really interested in the company. Neither were the kids. They were okay if it was making money, but eventually they just decided they wanted to sell it. Uh, and uh, so a couple of people buy it. Samuel Wiggins eventually buys out those people. And he, about 1821, he becomes the sole owner of the ferry business and all the Wiggett property in Illinois, which eventually will turn out to be perfect for coal mines. And so they really will control the coal mining in Illinois too, or at least in the Belleville area. Uh, and then in 27, he gets the exclusive rights from uh, the legislature to operate a ferry in St. Louis or to St. Louis. Um, that's important because the legislature builds a one mile buffer north and south into the legislation so that no one can compete with them. So if he owns a spot along the river, no one can compete one mile south or one mile north. Later, they're gonna expand that to two miles north and two miles south. So it's in, it's in Wiggins interest to buy as much riverfront property as he can. Eventually he's gonna own four miles and then he's got two more miles north and south where no one can compete. So he controls eight miles of river opposite of downtown St. Louis. You can't get to downtown without pay, well, without just the down, not just downtown at the time, downtown was the whole city, right? What we call downtown is the whole city. So you can't even get to St. Louis without paying Wiggins. If you, if you were to take another ferry, you'd have to go down to Cahokia and then cross over um, to Crandolette and then come back north on Broadway. Uh, so they have, Wiggins has this monopoly of, of, of everybody who's gonna cross. Uh, meanwhile, Bloody Island is growing. And I mentioned before, it's gonna threaten to take over uh, the river in St. Louis and, and cut it off. Like I said, Wiggins pays to, to, to stop that, keep the channel where it's at. Um, and of course they annex it, it becomes their property. So they control all the land on the Illinois side between Venice, uh, Illinois in the North and Cahokia in the South. That's a lot of land. A lot of people who are going to want to cross the river are going to have to use them. There's a great little picture for you to think about for a minute. Look at that cute little landing. He's got a little dock. There's a, his little ferry boats leaving. There's a, big, a bigger packet coming up the river. You can see St. Louis has grown by the time this picture is now in addition to the old cathedral and the old courthouse, we're seeing lots of church steeples, lots of buildings over there. You can see Bloody Island 
forming on the right side of that picture. You see that? That's kind of great fun. Little guys in canoes there doing their thing, a flat boat out there doing its thing. Lots, if you zoomed in, you'd see a lot of steamboats already. So that's probably the 1850s when that picture is taken. Um, so let's see. I'm lost here for a second on my, there it is. All right. Let's just, let's just give you some logistics so you can see where they're at. So they've got landings on the Illinois side, about a half mile north of the, where the Eads Bridge is today. And then they would cross to Morgan Street, which is a few blocks north of Eads. Then they drop down see, through what now would be the Eads. And there's landings on both sides of the river there. Uh, and then down, on to, down to Spruce Street, um, which is just about where Poplar Street Bridge is today. Um, and here's something also to remember. Wiggins isn't just a ferry boat. Yeah. Wiggins owns all this property in what we call East St. Louis. In those days, it was known as Illinois Town. The roads to get to the ferry boat were toll roads that Wiggins okay. owned. So you paid Wiggins to get to his boat. And then if you had to eat or stay overnight, they called it taverns, but they were really like eating night. and lodging establishments. They did the exact same thing. They, they owned them too. And they owned warehouses because you may have to wait your turn to cross. So you'd have to put your, your stuff somewhere safe. You'd have to leave your, your horse with their, with their livery yard. Maybe you need your horse after traveling needs new shoes, they've got a blacksmith for you. And, and then later, all the steamboats that you see in St. Louis, all of them are being refueled by coal flats that are being brought to them by the, the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company um, because it's their coal. They've, they, that's the easiest place to, 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 ref, to, to find coal in St. Louis to refuel. So, so you're not just, the Wiggins folks aren't just making money because they're the only way you can cross in St. Louis, but it is also all of this super uh, infrastructure that they own to make that possible. They don't actually set the rates for their boats uh, to, the, to cross on their boats. Um, that's set by the Illinois le legislature. Uh, however, who makes up the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company? They're not steamboat people. They're bankers, politicians, judges, real estate investors, insurers, and maybe some steamboat men. Uh, and so the people who own the company, the people who are stockholders, the people who are on their board of directors, they're likely the legislators who are making um, the laws or may, setting the rates for you to cross. Now you'd say, Father Keller, that's a conflict of interest. The government can't do that, can they? And the answer is absolutely they did. In those days, there just wasn't the same awareness of conflict of interest, or at least there wasn't legislation to stop that, that, that um, conflict of interest. Uh, and so when you're looking at um, just a, um, a quick look, and most of this is because they named boats after these people. Uh, Andrew, uh, Andrew C. Christie, St. Louis Councilman, Missouri Senator. Samuel Christie, his son, president of the Bank of Illinois, uh, which was bailed out by the Wiggins Company, by the way. The, the state Bank of Illinois went bankrupt. And so the legislature went to the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company and Samuel Wiggins cut him a check so that they could keep stay in business. Um, that's just incredible to me. I guess maybe it is to you, I don't know. Um, this guy named Charles um, uh, Mulliken, uh, he's an insurer. And of course, what's he doing? He's insuring boats and docks, which is exactly what this, this company does. Um, and uh, you got this Louis V. Bogey, he's a Senator. He's also a judge. He's also president of the St. Louis Iron Mountain Railway. Um, Henry Sackman, Illinois uh, Railroad and Warehouse Commission. Uh, George A. Madgill, um, he's a circuit judge. Um, uh, Henry C. Harstick, 
uh, president of the St. Louis and Mississippi Valley Transit Company. And then finally, you get to a steamboat captain who also ran for and was mayor of St. Louis. And that's when the Eads Bridge opened. He was, he was against the bridge before he was for it. And that's, that's that the, when he was the president of the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, he fought against the bridge. When he was elected mayor, he was right there and, and, and ready to welcome people across on the bridge. Um, so that old monopoly, as they called them in the, in the newspapers, I guess a derogatory name for the, for the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company. Um, by, 189, by 1853, they had to renew their articles of incorporation. There was tons of resistance and a lot of fun reading in newspapers about how we hate this company, et cetera. Um, everybody complains about the high rates. It costs as much to ship something from New Orleans to St. Louis as it, as it costs to cross the river with Wiggins. Think about that for a second. It costs as much to ship something on a packet boat to St. Louis as it will to, to take that off the steamboat and cross to the Illinois side with it. That's, that's incredible to me. Um, of course, you say, well, did they get their articles of, of incorporation renewed? Of course, because of all the po political and financial connections at, Wiz at Wiggins, it was business as usual. Not only did they incorporate, uh, uh, but they also in, in about 1853 started building their own private town to house all the people that they need to work there, um, which is something not uncommon in the, in the 1800s. Now we finally get to the railroads, which most of you are interested in. Now there's no railroad picture at this point because essentially everything is taken off of the, of the train and uh, the, the, the tracks come at the river perpendicular. They stop in, on a platform, everything is unloaded and then put on, on, on wagons or put on hand carts really. Uh, and then loaded down onto the wagon ferries. Everything is done by roustabouts, which are steamboat laborers. What, what would happen is uh, generally African-American men, maybe age 16 to, to 20, 25 or so, uh, if they were unmarried generally, um, they would be a steamboat route. They could become a steamboat roustabout. You just go down to the levee and a mate would, would pick you if you looked like you could work. Uh, and you were paid per day or per uh, trip. So if the trip was going to New Orleans, you'd be paid for the trip. You were expected to work 24 hours a day on the boat at any point you were needed, which wasn't all 24 hours, but would be whenever somebody uh, hailed the boat and the boat stopped in the middle of the night or in the middle of the day and something needed to be loaded or unloaded, uh, they would call on those roustabouts to do that. The, 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 the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, even though it didn't leave St. Louis, it basically used the same type of, 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 of labor arrangement, which was people who were just picked for the work that day, or maybe they just had a steady arrangement, but they were paid um, like every other steamboat roustabout, which would have been very little and the work was very hard. I've heard people say that those guys were expected to be able to lift 300 pounds on their back and carry it. Um, that's, that's a lot. And so um, the Ohio and Mississippi Railway is the first to get there, but also the St. Louis Alton and Terre Haute, the Belleville and St. Louis Suburban, it's called, and the Chicago and Alton Railroads. They're coming in perpendicular. They're, everything is, is, is unloaded by roustabouts, put on wagon ferries, take them to the other side, another set of roustabouts, unload it, uh, and then it's, it's dispersed to wherever it's, it's meant to go uh, from, from the levee there. Um, of course, people hate the, the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company. This is a great quote. Um, we will take stock in the bridge company, if necessary, anything to free us from that nightmare ferry, which is not only a real tear, but a real, not only a tear, but a real vampire sucking our very lifeblood. That's a farmer in, in uh, 1865. Uh, and uh, Alton Telegraph, 
uh, editorial says, it's doubtful whether the historic black hole of Calcutta is, redult is redultant of a more filthy and disgusting conglomeration of bad odors than that of the cabins of the St. Louis ferry boats. The boats are, uns uh, the boats are safe, but they ran those boats for years and years, the average life of a steamboat on the Mississippi during the golden age of steamboating would have been three years. These boats ran for over a decade, sometimes two, because they're not experiencing, number one, obstacles on the river like the packet boats did, but also because the ferry boat company just ran those boats until they were just not able to run anymore. Uh, because the like for every steamboat company, the goal is to, to make money. But for them, there was no competition. So there was no intent, no need to get a bigger and better boat to attract more business. Um, their wharf boats were hazardous. The, um, there's all sorts of lawsuits, people falling in the river, no guardrails. The, sometimes it's just a plank of wood that's thrown down into the mud. Uh, they really didn't care as long as you paid to get on and off. Um, then the landings themselves, if you think about all of the, the trains unloading and those wagons and hand carts being quickly moved by roustabouts from place to place, you were lucky to get out without getting knocked down. Um, so we've got the first threat in years. The, the, the Madison Ferry Company's the first real threat from 1791 to 1869, finally, there's, a, there, there's another ferry boat company just outside the, um, the East St. Louis uh, or Illinois side eight mile buffer. It's running out of, of Venice, Illinois, which is just outside the Wiggins territory. And it's, and it's bringing people to downtown. So the ferry ride is longer. Uh, the rates are probably the, about the same. They're set by the Illinois, Illinois legislature. Um, but the very fact that they're taking business from the Wiggins company is, 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 is not, not something they're happy with. And then what makes it even worse is that they introduce a new boat that had not been used before, the railroad transfer, or sometimes called a car ferry. Uh, and there we have a picture uh, of one right there, uh, the Lewis V. Bogey. That's their response in 1870, the next year. Um, the w Wiggins gets their own car ferry. So there's, there's two, so, so they begin to do that. They're forced to do that. So uh, no longer do they have to uh, 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 break bulk, as they say, but now they can roll those cars right onto a steamboat and, and, and move, move, the, move the freight. There's a great picture of an early car ferry, better than that, the drawing. Um, that's actually not a Wiggins ferry. That's that's Missouri Pacific, um, and the name of the boat is the Pacific. Uh, and so, um, uh, but that's just a great picture, a lot of action in that, I guess we could say with the, with the train moving, guys standing on the cars, um, the boat waiting to leave when the, when the train uh, exits. Um, by then, 1870, let's say, this is right before the Eads Bridge. The photo has the, or the picture has the Eads Bridge, but in fact, um, right before the Eads Bridge, uh, Wiggins is expanded. They still have their toll roads. They still have the, 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 the hotels, everything like that. Uh, but they've added to it um, housing, a school, the Douglas School. They've got a Presbyterian church on their property. They've, they've had to build a hospital because of cholera outbreaks. Uh, and uh, they've got all these terminal rail warehouses for the, the various train companies that are terminating right there uh, at, at East St. Louis. They've got the largest icing facilities for rail car, for refrigerated rail cars. And of course, now they've got refueling and repair uh, facilities for the locomotives. They've got switching facilities. They've got mills. They've got uh, lumber yards. They've got grain elevators. That's what you're seeing there in the in the photo is or in the picture. That's a, a grain elevator. They had multiple grain elevators at at one time, and they were by seven 1873. They've got multiple routes, both for their wagon ferries and the transfers. 
They're running seven ferries for wagons and passengers. They've got one big railroad transfer and three, that should say barges, not badges, sorry. Uh, and they're being pushed by tugs and towboats. They're moving 1,500 passengers a day, 750 wagons a day, and 100 train cars a day. But there's another threat. As you know, in 1873, the, the Eads Bridge is already under construction. You've got a character named Lucius Boomer. He's from Chicago. He proposes a plan to build a, a bridge across the Mississippi. Uh, but of course, St. Louisans are unhappy with his Chicago connections. They don't trust that he's going to be working in St. Louis uh, best interest. And everybody suspects he's in Wiggins' pocket. A matter of fact, there's a popular story that's being told that if Lucius Boomer gets the contract, he will not build the bridge for 25 years because Wiggins bought him off to, to, to delay the project. There's no way to know if that was true, but he doesn't get the project. You, your friend James Buchanan Eads gets the project uh, and they build right through the center of Wiggins property. There's court cases and eventually they get paid, but not much for the property. And the bridge opens uh, in, in 1874. I think every St. Louisan believes Wiggins will be closed within a year. And if you look at the newspaper articles from that time, they're basically given eulogies of the Wiggins uh, company. They're given the history of the company and saying how great it was, you know, but it's a shame, you know, history moves on, progress, industry. The Wiggins company is, is, is going be, is, is, is to be in the dustpan of history. There's even one great uh, article. I, I, um, I'm not sure what I did with that. But the person goes through this wonderful description of all their boats over the years. It was great because that was made it easy to, to identify which boats were the Wiggins boats over the, over the course of a century. Uh, but at the end, they say, too bad that the board of directors have, have, have either left the area or gone insane. <laughs> And they've been they've been locked up because they're insane. I, 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 that's probably yellow journalism. They probably didn't go insane. Matter of fact, they made more money than they had ever, even after the Eads Bridge was built. Eads Bridge was built with only one gauge, whereas all the uh, the ferry boats were custom built for the for the for the companies that they were using. Um, the approach to the to, to uh, on the east side of the bridge was um, really long and out of the way, and very few train companies could connect to it quickly and easily. Um, and of course, once you got to the west side and the St. Louis side, the tunnels were toxic because they didn't ventil ventilate the uh, the exhaust from the trains well. Uh, and so the underground stations that were designed with the Eads Bridge were unusable and Union Depot at the time was remote and outside the city. It's basically built in Shoto's Pond, which is outside the city. And if you got off the train, there was just nothing there. Eventually they build a Union Depot there, um, uh, but it's a small, a small set of buildings and uh, because there really weren't that many trains using the Eads Bridge like everybody thought they would. And just to keep, uh, uh, just to keep things interesting, um, the Wiggins Company, now more profitable than ever, um, opens a little passenger ferry you see in that picture, uh, the, the D.W. Hewitt. And they gave out free whiskey to patrons and thus stealing business from the Eads Bridge. Why walk across that bridge in a hot day when you can take when the boat can take you and give you free whiskey uh, on the side? So the bridge goes into bankruptcy, not just because of the Wiggins, but maybe because it wasn't designed in a way to be profitable. But Wiggins definitely was more profitable than ever. Uh, by 1875, the year after the bridge was built. You have the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy, the Chicago, Alton, and St. Louis, the Baltimore and Ohio, the St. Louis, Vandalia, and Terre Haute, St. Louis and Nashville, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis, Illinois Central, Mo Mobile, and, and Ohio, Louisville, and uh, Evansville, and St. Louis consolidated. They're all there. And that's a picture, it's probably 
That's probably a little later than 1875, but it doesn't matter because that's probably what it looked like for a good decade or so after the bridge was built. Those are all trains that'll never take that bridge, but are using the Wiggins Ferry Company to cross the river in one manner or another. Um, I won't go through all that, but you can see that's how many uh, railroad transfers were, were being used. There's four side wheel transfers. There's a number of tugboats pushing a transfer barge, number of, of stern wheel towboats moving transfer barges. You can see the times though, you got the 1874 era of 1880, which is, you know, all this is, is happening after the bridge is built. 1883, 1891, 97, all those new boats are being bought or built or bought uh, uh, and uh, brought to St. Louis uh, to compete with the bridge. Um, the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company eventually buys the, uh, the Madison, or they, they lease essentially the Madison uh, uh, Ferry Boat Company up in Venice, Illinois. And also they have a supporting railroad um, and uh, they buy them. Uh, the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company starts to become not a ferry boat company, but a railroad here. Um, they aren't just unloading and supplying trains. They begin to buy their own locomotives and lay their own track and become their own thing. Um, and the only company that's really competing with them is down, down in Cahokia, and, and Crondelet, uh, the Missouri Pacific, the transfers um, Missouri and Pacific, they are the only competitors of Wiggins really uh, at that period. And so um, this is probably a picture from 1913. There's a great flood. The only good pictures of Wiggins comes from when there's a flood. Um, but on the Illinois side, they become a railroad, the East St. Louis Connecting Railroad. And they have tracks parallel to the river that connect all of the other tr uh, train facilities. And they add their own um, switch, uh, switching yards and, and everything on the east side is connected by that. And then a few years later, they connect everything on the St. Louis side with the St. Louis Transfer Railway. Uh, there's court cases going all the way to the Supreme Court about roustabouts and are they really train employees? And if they are, there should be pensions, there should be um, different pay scales, etc. So Wiggins is forced to create the Wiggins Transfer Company, which is folks who move freight. Um, and so they have to adopt railroad rules. That's a great map. Thanks to uh, Mercantile for sharing that with me. You can see Mississippi is going from right, uh, from left to right. That's down river, down river, up river is left, down river right. That's East St. Louis on the top and St. Louis on the bottom, and all that dark area in the center is uh, the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company property. And look at all the rails perpen uh, perpendicular to the to uh, the river, and all the different companies that I just listed are are found in, 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 in that. The dark, thing, dark areas on that map are buildings that e either owned by Wiggins or are on Wiggins property owned by the railroads. They were happy to sell the property to get the railroads there as long as they kept the property right along the river so that they would, wouldn't have a competitor. Um, I don't know whether you wanna peek at that longer or if that's... Uh, long enough. There's a ton of stuff in that. It's a great, great picture. Great, great map. Maybe we'll move on. And that's what you're seeing. That's, that's in 1913. That's during the Great Flood. You can see water in the front. You can see water behind. The high area in between is the old Bloody Island, which is now connected to the Illinois mainland, except during a flood. And uh, from left to right, you're looking at Wiggins, those grain elevators, you're looking at a small little ferry, the Alonzo Church. Uh, there's um, the kind of uh, low to the ground there, but you see long roof lines there coming from the, from the boats back. That, those are the B&O rail, Railroad warehouses, the terminals. Um, and then uh, the big steamboat in the center is the George A. Maddell, which is a railroad transfer. 
Um, there's a boat, if we zoom in, you'll see it. It's the Henry L. Clark. There's a transfer barge there where the trains were loaded on the transfers. Then there's a boat I can't figure out what exactly it is. It's got to be leased by the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, the, the JCM Mullen. Uh, it doesn't show up in, in steamboat rosters that I have access to, but I'm betting anything it was built for somewhere else and they, they leased it. Um, and then above that second boat there, second railroad transfer on the right, you can see lots of lots of lots, lots of, of blocks of buildings. And that's the remains of that company town that was still, uh, still being used, although most of it had been leveled for, for trains over time. Uh, there's a little coal flat. And then on the far, far right, you see another steamboat. That is the Charles Miram, another railroad transfer. You can look at that more closely now. You see the, the Alonzo Church and the B&O um, long terminals there on, on the right. And then as we move along the Maddle again, and uh, there's a, again, it's hard to see, but there's another boat behind it. And then the the, the buildings there, you can probably see the school, that's the Douglas School there on the right, and then um, uh, a transfer barge in the river there. And then we'll move a little further down to see that GCM, GCM Mullen boat, that's a dirty old boat, um, and uh, uh, more buildings there as part of the, the former town. Uh, and then way on the side there is the uh, Charles Miram. Now we're on the other side of the river and it is definitely not a flood. It is low river stage, really low. It's probably 1917. All those bo boats are probably um, boarded up and not being used anymore. Why are they not white like steamboats are normally? The Wiggins company around 1890 started painting all their boats red. And uh, I guess to make them distinct from the other steamboats on the river, I guess. Um, maybe because they were probably moldy and ugly looking, so they painted red iron oxide on them so that they wouldn't look so bad. They just look, probably looked the same color as a Missouri barn. Um, so if we start at the bottom and go to the top of that page there, you've got coal flats uh, and a wharf boat. Then you can see a transfer barge, and you know it's a transfer barge because it's got all of that hog chains up on top so that the boat could, could handle the weight of the train locomotives if they had to cross, but most likely the train cars themselves were all that they transferred. Then there's two, um, two uh, uh, big transfer boats, um, rail or car ferries. That's the George uh, Maddle again, now painted red. And then the Henry Sackman, it's gotta be the Henry Sackman because all the rest of their boats were gone by 1817, I mean, 1917. And then the boat that I built, the Julius S. Walsh, that ferry boat, and then an Andrew Christie, another wagon, well, automobile ferry by that point. Uh, and then the white boat further up is the Mark Twain. It used to be the Erastus Wells. But then you notice there are just no boats on the levee. There, there would have been boats I'm not sure if they have, uh, they, they're just all gone when the picture is taken. Picture's probably taken from the, what, uh, um, um, uh, the second bridge, which is called the Free Bridge. And now what's it, the uh, uh, Douglas Bridge, Douglas uh, Bridge. We can look at that a little more closely. Those boats are all shuttered. You can see the pilot houses are boarded up and everything. That's the end of the line for those for, for the whole ferry company when that picture is being taken probably. Because they have an unbeatable, unbeatable foe, the Terminal Railroad Association. I'm sure you've heard of it. The Terminal Railroad Association with Jay Gould. Um, MacArthur Bridge is what I was trying to think of. That's right, I'm sorry about that. Jay Gould, you've probably heard of him. He founds the Terminal Railroad in 18, 89. He buys the Eads Bridge the same year. He's not allowed to buy the Mer Merchants Bridge by law. He does it anyway in, in 1893. Um, and then he opens Union Station in 94. That's probably a turning point for Wiggins Ferry because they've had um, all the infrastructure that the Eads Bridge didn't have. 
but now Union Station has that infrastructure for passengers and, and everything else. And so uh, Union Station is, is probably a, a major turning point. But uh, the, the Terminal Railroad Association continues to buy up everything. They're by the Illinois Railroad, the Illinois Transfer Railroad, the East St. Louis and Crondelet Railroad, the St. Louis Belt and Terminal Railroad. You can see in, in 1902, they're buying a lot of, a lot of, of their competitors and they want to buy the, 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 the Wiggins Ferry. There is a tremendously interesting few weeks and the newspapers are, are, are all looking at headlines about, are all posting headlines about the Wiggins Ferry. Rock Island quietly offers to buy Wiggins Ferry, um, uh, the ferry boat company, and uh, the board vote, votes to sell their stock, giving it to Rock Island, and they start buying up stock. Um, Letters are sent out to stockholders. Some stockholders have had this stock since the 1830s, 1820s. So it's descendants of, of folks who have owned that company. Uh, people who don't live in St. Louis anymore, people who live all over the country. Um, and quietly they're buying up stock, but then it breaks news and the terminal railroad enters competition and stock prices soar. So Wiggins Ferry Company, stock is supposed to be $100 a share. It normally sells for about $230 a share. Suddenly it's $1,500 a share. Um, and some stockholders essentially are becoming millionaires overnight. Um, they sell their stock and, 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 and they are set. Sometimes families were fighting over whether to sell now or sell later or, or sell it all. And Lawyers are presiding over family meetings because you know they're uh, they're unable to make good decisions and they're yeah, etc. And and a number of times the newspapers announce a winner. They say you know Rock Island bought this the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company, or they'd say the Terminal Railroad bought the the, the company, but they didn't. They didn't have all the stock yet. Everything comes down to a miner a 17 year old boy at St. Louis University whose parents had died and he had no legal guardian for some reason. And he can't sell the stock and nobody has the, 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 the majority of stock. Um, and so everything comes to a grinding halt until an out of court settlement later in 2000, I'm sorry, in 1903. And Rock Island sells in order to be admitted into the Terminal Railroad Association, which it had been blocked out of for years. Um, Julius S. Walsh is the president of the, of the Terminal Railroad Association. He now becomes the president of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, the ferry company, uh, and hence he gets a, a ferry named after him in a few years. Uh, but at that point, all seven ferries, 18 locomotives, 70 miles of track, eight miles of East St. Louis Riverfront property and all the facilities all go to, to the Terminal Railroad Association, which is still in existence today. And if you want to move anything through St. Louis, you're probably paying Terminal Railroad something. And you might even be um, moving it along, along on existing uh, railways that were built by Wiggins, because there's still some track today that's out there that's track that they laid. Um, although most of it, I think, has been replaced. Uh, well, probably all of it's been somewhat, but the original, the original place where it was is, is still being used. And so Wiggins starts to fade away. Um, Terminal Railroad continues to operate the Wiggins boats as long as they're profitable. They even build a few more boats like the Julius S. Walsh. Um, but basically, by 1819, all those boats are retired. The, the transfers are all done by then. But really, those boats aren't running year-round anymore anyway. I don't think any of them were. Uh, even the Julius S. Walsh uh, stopped regular service probably long before 1927, but certainly by 1927, it's it's it stopped and it's abandoned by 33. And as you, that's a picture of it in 33. Um, so uh, it's pretty much the end of the line for Wiggins. Uh, and uh, I do wanna do one little thing and say that 
and I've mentioned this before, the trans, the, the uh, Missouri, Missouri Pacific continues to, to, to run tr transfers, those big boats uh, south from Cahokia to Crondelet. Um, all the way to 1940. So it's not just because the Wiggins Ferry Boat Company ended, we didn't end total ferry service in St. Louis. There are even some other ferries, ferries on the Mississippi until later. Um, but the, the last of the big transfer boats, the William V. King, she worked, as I said earlier, until 1940. And that's a great photo of her. As the, as the rail cars got heavier, they had to lighten the boats. And so they pulled those great big boxes down off over the side wheels that are normal for, for Mississippi steamboats. So it must have been impressive to see a, a three story paddle wheel turn. And that would have been about the size of the paddle wheel that the Admiral would have had because that boat, the Yoakum and the, and the Albatross are essentially sister ships. Anyway, we're coming to the end if you're still awake. Uh, I want to thank you guys and acknowledge the Mercantile Library, especially. Also, I snagged photos from University of Wisconsin, Madison, Missouri Historical Society, and probably other spots on the internet. You have any questions? Anybody there? Thanks, Father Tom. Um, Thanks. We've got a couple of questions. Bradley Scott had a question about the uh, barge. I think it was in one of the earlier slides. Mm -hmm. uh, a barge, other object that was marked public. And I think that might have been on the Wiggins Ferry map. Right. In the picture of the Eads Bridge. Picture of the Eads Bridge, okay. Picture of the Eads Bridge. I'm looking at such tiny little pictures. Yeah. In my... Oh, I see. Those are barges coming up the river in, a, in that picture, I suspect. That's a, that's a, uh, well, my suppose so. It looks like it's going to hit the pier from this perspective. What do you think? That unfortunately, that picture, if you see on the very right edge of it, it cuts up to another photograph there or a repetition of the first one. It's probably one of those old pictures you would have viewed through a, uh, lenses that you put up against your, your, your face like, like a pair of reading glasses. Uh, so that looks to me like an early barge being pushed by a towboat. But on the other hand, it just looks like it's right there in the middle of that pier. So I don't know if I can answer that question very intelligently, but it's a good question. Yeah, that is a, uh, might be worth seeing if there was a barge line nickname or yeah. called public barge line or something like that. Yeah, yeah. A stereotopic, is that a stereo? stereoscopic yeah. viewer is what that is scary so but yeah um now when we're looking at that picture look at that just you, that wharf boat that that hue hewick um is tied up to that little thing is precarious and so is its ramp <laughs> yeah but you get free whiskey so i'm sure it's worth the risk yes take what you can get on that one <laughs> yeah um let's see he had another question. Brad had another question about the Rock Island and the Frisco, and uh, Renee actually answered that in the chat. Uh, was the Rock Island affiliated with the Frisco when it started buying Wiggins stock in 1902? And um, it, they, they got joined together under the Yoakum Syndicate in 1905. So that's, uh, or I can't remember when that started, but there was a period of time when the Rock and the Frisco were essentially brigaded together under a syndicate. So I think when you and I were talking earlier, uh, last earlier this week, we talked about how the Santa Fe and the Rock Island were kind of together in a sense that, uh, I can't remember how we were, the Santa Fe was not allowed in St. Louis, Rock Island wasn't allowed in St. Louis, but it seemed like they could get, the, that Santa Fe could sell. It was, St. it was Louis, San Kansas City and Colorado to Wiggins, and then Wiggins turned around and sold it to Rock Island, and Rock Island turned around and tried to, to buy Wiggins. Um, it, it, it all had to deal with getting uh, access through a state railroad charter, and for whatever reason, Santa Fe was having trouble getting into St. Louis, um, and they were going to use the rocks um, as a vehicle to do that, um, and that was at Can Kansas City that railroad name you just mentioned, 
that was a paper railroad that became the Rock Islands Missouri Division. Right, the, the, the St. Louis, Kansas City and, and Colorado, it didn't really fully exist yet. Yeah, yeah, right. And then, uh, yeah, Santa Fe opted not to pursue that at the end and went to Chicago on its own. Uh, so, but that is, oh, what was that in? It was in the official history of the Rock Island where they talk about all the machinations that became the Missouri Division. So, um, let's see. We do have a question from John Brown. Hey, uh, hey Nick. Nick. Hey, Father Keller. Thank you for a great presentation. I'm really blown away by your research. You have done piles of research, um, which I know because I've done some research on the Eads Bridge. So uh, a, a little nugget for you, which given your research, you probably already know. The Hewitt, which you showed uh, the first passenger ferry strictly dedicated for passengers, for pedestrians, the Hewitt uh, was bought by Wiggins from St. Louis Bridge. It had been a work boat for St. Louis Bridge. And when they finished the bridge, they didn't need their work boat anymore. So Wiggins bought it and then refitted the whole thing and made it quite elegant. So there's some lovely irony that Wiggins turned this vessel around and made it a tool to beat up on the bridge company. Um, well, that's interesting. I did not know that. Um, what I know mostly about these boats come from Captain Frederick Way. Um, Captain Fred Way uh, in the Way's Packet Directory. Yeah. Uh, or sometimes uh, I found some other stuff along the way, might have been in I waterway journals or uh, 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 newspaper articles, but I did not know that. That's, that's great. That's funny that they, they bought an old work boat that built the bridge and turned it around to compete with them. Yep, yep, pretty cool. That's not, not surprising. So uh, the other question I have for you and okay. for everyone, um, do I get another one? Anyone else have any questions? We're pretty much, we're actually after three o'clock. So uh, then I'll save it. I'll, uh, it'll, I, I can correspond directly with Father Keller. Absolutely. All right. Well, Father Tom, thank you again for joining us again on your Saturday, just like Dave took a, his, an hour of his Saturday out to join us. Uh, we really appreciate it. And it was an excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, if folks have questions for, again, Father Tom or Dave later on, you can email me. You can email Sarah Hodge, who's the Pot Waterways Curator. Um, and again, also, we will have recordings of this presentation and my, follow, my following presentation and Dave's presentation. We'll have those online via our YouTube, hopefully within the next 24 to 48 hours. So uh, again, Father Tom, thank you so much. All right. Thanks. All right, uh, and we are going to hop right on over to the final presentation of the day on river boats that, uh, and ferry boats that were, uh, shall we say, not common uh, to the Mississippi River, although we're gonna talk a little bit about the Mississippi too. And just real quick, uh, can everybody see my PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay, great. So we've covered the Mississippi really well already. And this also, it, this is a presentation that some folks may already have some familiarity with um, because this, this presentation, this, this day attracted folks who were interested in inland waterways as well as railroads. But uh, we're gonna look at a, a more, holistic and broader overview of other rail marine operations in the United States. Um, this one is not going to entirely focus on inland waterways. We are going to talk about two of the most significant US uh, based uh, open water uh, freight uh, rail and passenger rail transfer operations uh, before we uh, before we get kicked out of here. So um, in the 18th uh, 30s, we have the railroad industry starting up. You've got the United States, essentially, uh, it doesn't stretch entirely from the Atlantic to the Pacific. It does go to the Pacific Northwest. We've got plenty of rivers and mountains to cross, and the initial railroads are uh, very regional in nature. Uh, Baltimore and Ohio, 
uh, Mohawk and Hudson River. Uh, uh, the uh, New York, New Haven and Hartford. These are railroads that have a very limited geographic focus. Uh, in many cases, they are linking components of the uh, uh, what I want to say, the, the um, existing inland waterways network. And uh, they are they're cooperative. They're not necessarily competing at the moment with the existing inland waterways. So uh, the idea of having to cross a, a river isn't something that necessarily is, is there something railroads are worrying about right now. Uh, it does start to appear shockingly on the East Coast uh, where you do have occasionally the inconveniently placed river for Western commerce, uh, such as the Hudson or the Susquehanna uh, that you're gonna have to deal with. And in some places, um, those rivers are significant uh, enough in width that uh, bridging them at the time is more expensive uh, or would take too much time for these railroad companies to invest in. So the ferry boat becomes a convenient stopgap. Uh, also, conveniently uh, for the companies, the, the marine application of steam power shows up to help make this uh, a feasible project. And we get our first uh, railroad ferry in 1836, this is not actually the original ferry boat, uh, but this is the uh, the site. Uh, this is the uh, the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore's ferry operation on the Susquehanna River at the very almost near the mouth of the river, almost at the mouth of the river in Maryland, uh, connecting the towns of Havre de Grace, Maryland, and Perryville. Uh, it was uh, a steam ferry. It uh, was in existence until after the Civil War as an operating ferry operation. It does play an important uh, historical footnote in the early days of the Civil War uh, in that uh, the seizure of the ferry boat allowed uh, troops to bypass the city of Baltimore from the north and get into Washington, DC. The railroad bridges uh, north of Baltimore had been burned. So this ferry boat uh, was pressed into service uh, to move troops. And actually that's what um, Nast, Thomas Nast is sketching in this uh, uh, Harper's uh, image. And you can see there's the railroad cars and there's the ferry boat and there's the landing. The actual landing site is still visible in town today. It's, it's a depressed street that goes down to the riverfront. But uh, after the war, they, they start bridging and that's pretty much the end of it, but it is a success. It, it allows the Philadelphia, Wilmington and Baltimore Railroad to do exactly what it needs to do. And it allows this regional railroad to carry out its mission. Now, in the following two decades, the 1840s, the 1850s, these regional railroads start to look over the horizon and the network starts to expand. Uh, in most cases, uh, the first river that railroad executives and engineers are gonna start looking at uh, uh, how to deal with is the Ohio. Uh, most of the railroad construction is in the North and the Mid-Atlantic. There is some construction in the South, but that's not quite at the pace, uh, the feverish pace that the Northern and Mid-Atlantic railroad lines are seeing. And again, the Ohio becomes a flashpoint of, of uh, engineering uh, trade-offs. It's too wide to bridge. It's too expensive to bridge. They do bridge the, the, the line, the river in, in 1852 at Wheeling with a very famous uh, Eads designed uh, bridge, which still stands to this day or Ellet Bridge. Um, but for that's a, that was a, a horse and pedestrian bridge. It was not a railroad bridge. The engineering that was required and the expense that was required was far in excess of what most railroad companies were willing to pay. And further, as the uh, Eads Bridge folks will tell you and the Rock Island Bridge folks would tell you, uh, the steamboat interests were a powerful adversary in preventing your bridge from getting uh, approval for construction. So the ferry boat becomes a convenient stopgap. This is a 
an inset uh, from an article in the BNO Historical Society's magazine, The Sentinel, about one of the early ferry boat operations. This was an 1855 operation between the town of Benwood, uh, West Virginia, which at the time was Benwood, Virginia, just south of Wheeling, and the town of Bel Air, Ohio. And uh, that was initially one of the earliest bridging operations of, of moving freight cars across uh, the Ohio River. Uh, one thing uh, to note about this situation, it was unique in that the, uh, the two railroads in question, the B&O and the, Central, or the Ohio Central had slightly different gauge. So if you're gonna run cars between those two companies, they had to have uh, wheels that would work on both, uh, both sets of track. And uh, that became kind of a niche industry with railroad uh, freight car design is building uh, universal wheels rather than setting a standard for track gauge, which is the width between the rails. Uh, they built cars that could run on various gauges. That's going to be kind of an on and off thing until the 1870s when we finally standardized gauging, but uh, that was an initial uh, process here in Ohio. And the the map showed a very primitive operation. This is a, a slightly later, but shows the primitive nature yeah, of this. And I have to apologize for the announcement here. Okay, so you guys got to miss the announcement that the library computer lab's closing in 15 minutes. So uh, this is in Parkersburg, West Virginia on the Little Kanawha River. Uh, it was running into the 20th century and it was a very primitive operation. And I use it because it's, it's some of the better photographic representations that show what an 1850s, uh, 19th century era car ferry operation would look like. Uh, Notice that the, uh, the locomotive, it's gonna get its wheels wet here. This is the, uh, the bridge you would use to get to your barge. And that's what the operation would look like. Uh, this, uh, there's a nice little article from a 2006 issue of the Sentinel about this whole operation, but it's an excellent photographic record to help kind of show you what this initial early 19th century primitive ferry boat operation was. And, one reason why the moment that most of these railroad companies could build a bridge, they did so. Uh, this was just an operational headache and I'm sure that the engine crews were not real happy to see some of the, uh, you know, are we supposed to be sinking like this? Did they load the cars right? Uh, it's somewhat disconcerting. Now I do have to mention the anti-train ferry or if you're a Superman fan, the Bizarro train ferry. Uh, we did have, uh, uh, in the 19th century, a great uh, portage railroad operation in Pennsylvania that became part of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And you can still visit it today at the Allegheny Portage National Historic Site. But uh, this operation from 1834 to 1854 reversed the concept that we're talking about and put the boats on the railroad instead of the railroad on the boats. I felt I was honor bound to cover it because, you know, we had such a strong waterways involvement today. So, uh, as the time went on in the, in the 19th century, the ferry boat operations were pretty standard. We had you know, operate ferry boats uh, operating here in St. Louis. We had them in Cincinnati. We had them in uh, Louisville, uh, Pittsburgh, New York, uh, nothing. You know, the technology was pretty static. It's not until the Civil War that uh, the next idea of, of rail and water transportation starts to show up, and that's um, moving trains worth of freight a significant distance, either to get around uh, a bottleneck, an operational bottleneck, or to uh, get around the competition. And with the Civil War, you had both bottlenecks. And if you were the United States Army and Herman Hopped, the competition was the Confederate Army continually wrecking your railroad tracks and making the supply line vulnerable. Uh, if you could figure out a way to, to get around that, so much the better. And the soldiers who were looking for those uh, letters, food parcels, 
ammunition, medical supplies, they were happy too. And Haupt gets credit for developing one of what essentially became the first modern car float operation in the United States, where entire railroad cars were loaded, in this case, two canal barges that had been conscripted for this project with transverse tracks. Uh, and here's the, here's the pier that would match up with these tracks. And uh, these cars would be tied down to these canal boats that were made into a barge. Um, they had a sophisticated um, uh, car float bridge to allow for um, the uh, safe loading of the barge in such a way that you wouldn't flip the barge over, which was important because you know if you sink the barge while you're loading it, well, you've just ruined your day. And it, it worked. It, this uh, operation went down the Potomac River from Alexandria, which was the principal Union railhead in Virginia, to, um, in most cases, it went down to Aquia Creek, which is between Washington, D.C. and Fredericksburg uh, on the Potomac River. Uh, it's, it was the original endpoint of the Richmond, Fredericksburg, and Potomac. Uh, Bernard Kapinski, uh, who you may have seen at an earlier Barrier seminar for his Civil War Railroad uh, layout, uh, he did a model of this operation uh, for, his, for his layout uh, and scratch built it. And that's, this is an excellent representation to help people understand how this worked. You know, the, the bridge is going to float here with the barge, compensate and allow for the safe loading and unloading of the barge, uh, of the railroad cars on the barge. Uh, just a brilliant concept. And honestly, the technology is still in use to this day. Uh, the fundamental idea of, of a compensating bridge that uh, moves with the, with the weights uh, and moves with the barge uh, is elegantly simple, elegantly brilliant, mechanically simple to maintain, and it works. And there's never been any real need to improve that. With that, uh, you do see later an expansion of the concept uh, of railroad ferries and barge operations. The Union Pacific, which uh, starts its construction at Omaha, Nebraska, on the other side of the Missouri River from the railhead at Council Bluffs, does not have a bridge built and will not have a bridge built until after the transcontinental railroad itself is built. Uh, employs a ferry boat operation until the winter where the river uh, freezes over and then we'll lay a track across the river to connect uh, Council Bluff in Omaha and then take the track up when the river thaws. Uh, this operation was essentially the main lifeline for the, Missouri, for the Union Pacific as it constructed uh, its tracks west. Uh, it really won't be abandoned until the bridges are finished in, in the 1870s. Union Pacific doesn't get its own bridge at Omaha until 1872, but the Mississippi and Missouri bridge finishes earlier. And that's actually a Rock Island controlled bridge uh, by that time. Uh, and this becomes a theme. Uh, throughout the country. As, as the Civil War ends, you see these ferry boat operations start to literally dry up. We just talked about what happens in St. Louis. Yes, Wiggins in the short term thrived and survived after the Eads Bridge was built. Uh, but I mean, honestly, realistically, from a cost benefit standpoint and an operational elegance standpoint, the bridge is the better option. The bridge doesn't have to worry about uh, the uh, river freezing. The bridge doesn't have to worry about the river levels being too low. Occasionally, the bridge has to worry about river levels, river levels being too high, uh, as, as in fact, a few years ago, uh, the Eads Bridge saw that happen, where it took off a, a pilot house of a towboat during a flood. Uh, but when bridges get built, you start to see the ferry boat operations uh, retreat uh, in general. That's not to say it happens all at once. Um, you know, St. Genevieve, the Missouri and Indiana Railroad uh, was a longstanding and actually a late developing uh, rail ferry operation. It started in 1903 and ran until 1961 to connect 
uh, Illinois and Missouri, even after the Thebes Bridge was finished, it was still in operation. Uh, and in fact, if you ever want to read the, the justification for, for shutting it down, we have that in the John W. Berg of the third paper. Basically, Mopac was like, a, really, it's not worth keeping this going anymore, despite what some of our shippers are saying. Uh, we're just going to use the bridge. Uh, the company itself, there's a Charlie Duckworth of the Mopac Historical Society has an excellent history of the M&I that touches on all of this. Uh, and I highly recommend uh, reading it if you really want to dive into it. But essentially, there's, there's also some financial aspects of the M&I as a company uh, and its benefits uh, in terms of funny accounting or fun with accounting uh, that show up. Now you do see car ferry operations kind of do linger a little later on at upper Mississippi. And I think part of it is, is the icing of the rivers makes ferry boat operations difficult. When you've got a river that freezes, uh, you wanna get, you wanna stop having to deal with ferry boats pretty quick. South of St. Louis, the ferry boat operations kind of linger. Uh, this is the Queen and Crescent uh, ferry boat uh, operating out of Vicksburg, Mississippi. This starts in the 1880s um, and survives even after uh, J.P. Morgan uh, consolidates uh, into the Southern Railway and lasts until 1820 or 1926. Uh, again, a bridge across the river is the fundamental reason why this goes away. Uh, the economics just don't pan out. Also, uh, you're starting to see some competition and pressures on the railroads. And if there's a marginal line of business in this era in the 1920s, uh, they're going to start looking at getting rid of it. Uh, New Orleans had a significant and long-standing ferry operation, uh, including the Sunset Limited crossing here uh, between New Orleans and uh, Avondale, Louisiana. Uh, and that lasts until the 19, uh, 1950s, actually. Uh, the Huey Long Bridge is what puts that out of, out of business. Uh, there were six railroad ferries in operation in the 1930s in Louisiana. Uh, which, if you think about it, that's impressive, but also consider the difficulty of getting the Huey Long Bridge built uh, in Louisiana. Uh, the river is so busy down there, as Dave was pointing out, you know, it's just, you know, they can keep sending barges down, you've got ocean going traffic, and to really put a crimp on the fluidity of the river traffic by building the uh, Huey Long Bridge, uh, you're going to get a lot of resistance uh, from shippers and uh, municipal uh, entities saying, you know, you're, you, you want to do what to our, our, our bottom line here. Uh, but Huey Long does get that bridge built. Uh, and it, again, ends the railroad ferry operation in, in Louisiana. Uh, Wiggins, of course, was not the only uh, operation in, in the St. Louis area. Uh, this is a, a, Father Keller talked about Wiggins and its competition, but further west of town, we did have the North Missouri Railroad which is today Norfolk Southern, it became the Wabash. Uh, it had its own ferry operation uh, that connected uh, St. Louis to St. Charles. And then from St. Charles, it connected with the uh, Hannibal and St. Joseph Railroad uh, until it built its own line to Kansas City after the Civil War. Uh, this operation started in 1864. Uh, it's a great little uh, pamphlet about, uh, this came with the 1936 bridge getting constructed. Uh, but you see the various ferry boat operations on the Missouri here in St. Charles. And then 1871, the first bridge gets built and that's the end of the ferry boat. Uh, and then that bridge gets replaced by the current bridge that was a 1936 bridge. Uh, same thing happens in Cairo, Illinois. Uh, significant ferry boat operations for the Illinois Central and other companies in that area. Uh, when the IC builds its bridge across the Mississippi and or across the Ohio, that's pretty much the end of the ferry boat operation. Uh, what's driving all this bridge building? Well, one, the Civil War is over. Railroads are just expanding. They're moving beyond single region railroads uh, into multiple region railroads, uh, almost transcontinental. In fact, that becomes a big goal with a lot of the robber barons is to try and build or create or forge a trans a true transcontinental railroad system, much like uh, what we see in Canada today with the Canadian National and Canadian Pacific systems. Um, it never works out uh, for whatever reason, 
But this coupled with improved technologies, uh, there's investment, there's engineering expertise, there's metallurgical improvements that make bridge building across these major navigable rivers uh, feasible. And the other thing to note is if you've ever been on, say, uh, the MacArthur Bridge on an Amtrak train or uh, the Susquehanna Bridge on an Amtrak Northeast Quarter train, any of the bridges in Chicago that uh, are there, uh, these bridges are large, heavy duty, and either very high up, or they are mechanized in such a way to raise up and allow river traffic to pass underneath. Uh, Cleveland was famous for its, its uh, lift bridges, or uh, draw bridges. Uh, Chicago, New York uh, has a couple, uh, but you know, they're tall bridges in New York for the most part. Uh, this is pretty much, you know, this wave of construction is, is the death knell of the traditional railroad ferry as we think of it on a river in the United States. Uh, in fact, in all of North America, as these bridges get built, you see the ferries start to go away. And they're only either kept in place because the company is, is feels a need to keep it for a customer or some other economic reason. Uh, but for the most part, you know, they're gone by the 30s and 40s. Now, it doesn't mean that ferries in general do go away. They're, they become, they remain vitally important operations in harbors well into the 20th centuries. Uh, this is the uh, Southern Pacific Ferry in uh, San Francisco, uh, the uh, Solano. Uh, now, these ferries aren't necessarily there because they are vital to a transportation link. They're vital to alleviating gridlock and congestion on the rails. Uh, instead of having a ferry boat operation in the middle of nowhere crossing a significant river, what we have is ferry boat operations in congested harbor areas and urban terminals that alleviate congestion of rails. Excuse me one second. Okay, for those of you following at home, the library computer lab is now closed. Um, this operation uh, in San Francisco Bay lasted until 1958 with multiple railroads involved. There was a similar operation between Portland and Vancouver, Washington, uh, uh, which lasted for the most part until the bridge uh, between those two cities was built, but um, also was a convenient safety valve until capacity was, was, had really developed. But these, these harbor operations, I mean, for the most part, everybody thinks of the big East Coast ports. Uh, this is Boston. Uh, we've got railroad boxcars on barges being brought directly to a steamship at a pier. Uh, there's no need to lay track on this pier. There's no need to worry about switching for this pier. You just bring the boxcars, the stevedores come on board and move brake bulk cargo directly onto the ship. And then, of course, you've got the granddaddy of them all, New York Harbor, which uh, this is 1900 showing the, the New York freight railroads. This is actually, I pulled this off of Wikipedia. It was actually an excellent map for showing what we needed to see. Um, here's the High Line in Manhattan. If you've been to that park, there's Grand Central. There is no Penn Station yet because it's 1900. But look at all of the terminals here on the Hudson River in New Jersey and on Manhattan. And what this really doesn't show is the industrial uh, force that was on the island of Manhattan. You know, Manhattan did not lose its manufacturing until after the Second World War. Uh, that's something that that Younger people today who see New York don't really think about how much stuff was made on Manhattan. Um, and, and 
that stuff had to have raw materials and components brought in and finished goods moved out. And in most cases, it was on a boat for part of its travel to get to one of these terminals here in New Jersey. This is uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad's map of its New York operations um, after uh, Penn Station was built in 1917. So you've got the, the, the tunnels, you have the car ferry, which actually, honest to goodness, still exists and operates. And you had uh, connections to the Long Island Railroad in Brooklyn and uh, the Bay Ridge uh, area in Brooklyn. Staten Island had a, a railroad operation and an industrial operation. Uh, Queens had some fact and manufacturing. Uh, Jersey City was a significant manufacturing center. And, and all of this freight traffic, if it weren't for the barge operations, the existing uh, freight rail network just could not handle it. Um, Shocker, shocker, the B&O Railroad's uh, 26th Street Freight Station in Manhattan uh, here. Uh, this is, this, and B&O is a minor player, but it's moving a barge between Manhattan and New Jersey multiple times a day, and they're switching this yard and moving goods in and out all the time. And think about the B&O, the Lehigh Valley, the New York Central, the Erie, the New York Susquehanna and Western, the Central of New Jersey. That's a lot of traffic being moved about in a harbor by freight, uh, by barge freight. Uh, then you've got stuff going into the Bronx. This is the Central Railroad of New Jersey going to the Bronx. Uh, and then you've got, in addition, the, the harbor lighter operations that are going directly to uh, steamships. Now, this is an improvement over the boxcar situation where instead of committing a boxcar uh, to a barge that you've now lost use of that car uh, until it's unloaded and returned to service, you just unload all of this into a barge or a lighter and a company tugboat will take that to the ship that it's supposed to go to and it acts as a mobile transfer warehouse for you. Uh, they had specialized ones for liquids. They had specialized ones for uh, refrigerated goods. Uh, this was eventually how New York Harbor was handled really until containerization showed up uh, and, and took over, uh, the, eliminated break bulk uh, as an operation. Now, everybody in New York had one of these. You've got three different railroads right here on their own. And it was not uh, just confined to New York. Every major port, east, west, uh, Gulf Coast, generally had some kind of lighterage operation. And if you go to the various railroad historical societies, there are enough folks uh, who are interested in the rail marine aspect that you will find a plethora of, of individual articles. Um, also, the developments were covered in the trade publications because this was a you know, one reason why the railroads were taken over in 1917 was how it, how uh, they had problems with uh, transferring goods from the railroads to the maritime customers to go across to Europe during World War I. There's a lot of outside factors involved, but anything that could have improved efficiency was going to get coverage. Now, I mentioned there is one operation in New York still standing. It was, it is the New York, New Jersey Railroad. Uh, they, they still exist and they basically run the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad's uh, route for their car fluid operation between New Jersey and Brooklyn. And, and they're still there. Uh, they connect with the New York and Atlantic. Uh, they are a class three terminal railroad. I don't think they've been bought up by uh, a, one of the holding companies yet, but um, they're still there. If you happen to check out uh, some of the uh, the uh, various websites, uh, it's, it is a, uh, a magnet for rail fan photographers because it's the last one left. Uh, now, while the harbor uh, rail ferry operations and barge operations have flourished into the, the 20th century because of congestion in an urban area, there are other situations where congestion or the potential of congestion led to the adoption of a maritime interface with a freight railroad. Uh, one of them was uh, the uh, 
export of U.S. coal from New York State to Coburg in Ontario, Canada. Uh, this was a uh, this lasted until 1951, and it was originally with the Buffalo, Rochester, and Pittsburgh Railroad, which itself was a, a coal hauling and a timber railroad from its origins and made a lot of money hauling coal. Uh, it connected at Rochester and uh, handed off to the uh, Ontario Car Ferry Company, which had the Car Ferry Ontario between Charlotte Dock, New York, and Coburg, Ontario. Uh, it was a very profitable and interesting operation for a period of time, and then it was it became very much less so. Uh, there's a there's a whole book about the company called Coal to Canada that if you're interested in getting the full story on, uh, but a very interesting little little operation. Uh, you also had operations of a similar nature on Lake Erie. This is the Ashtab Ashtabula. Uh, that connected Ashtabula, Ohio with Port Burwell, Canada. Again, it was a coal operation. Uh, also, uh, it moved iron ore to Canadian steel mills uh, that were developing in Ontario and Quebec. So uh, they were looking for American metallurgical coal and uh, iron ore, and uh, they found a ready market uh, to justify the expense of, of building this ferry boat here to carry train cars, hopper cars full of those commodities to Canada. Now, as you go further west, you did have uh, an early ferry boat operation in Detroit with the Michigan Central. Uh, that doesn't last particularly long, thanks to instead of building a bridge, they decide we're going to build a tunnel underneath the Detroit River. Uh, Michigan Central buys that, builds that, and uh, that pretty much eliminates the need for uh, the, the car ferry operation. If you go on to shorpy.com, which is a historic photo website, you'll see a lot of pictures of this particular ferry boat in the winter. Uh, one convenient thing that sometimes these boats uh, would do, and you'll see it with the larger Lake Michigan ferry boats, uh, they had icebreaker bows or uh, were in, pressed into icebreaker operations to help other uh, boats with uh, Lake Commerce. And in fact, the Spartan and the Badger both uh, had that capability. Uh, Lake Michigan was another area where uh, it's such an enticing shortcut to connect uh, a very industrial state with Michigan. You know, you think about all the automobile uh, plants and the component plants that were built in Michigan that needed steel. Uh, I mean, Historic imagery of River Rouge is a great example of what's going on there. Those raw materials, particularly iron ore, is on the other side of, of Wisconsin in Minnesota, uh, in the Misabi Range. If you can get that economically to Michigan, so much the better. Uh, Henry Ford opted to go with lake boats, but other companies, uh, you know, didn't have their own lake boat operations, and they went with rail transit. And companies like the Ann Arbor, the Paramarquette, uh, the Grand Trunk, uh, all had uh, ferry boat operations uh, that would take entire trains worth of freight across uh, Lake Michigan. Uh, we have, uh, fortunately, one example of these boats still running today. It is not a railroad ferry anymore, but the, uh, the Badger still runs, uh, Lord willing, uh, between uh, Ludington and Manawatuk uh, to this day. And uh, it's, it's now kind of a marketing as a passenger and uh, you know, take the experience, sa uh, save some time between the two points rather than driving all the way down the coast and all the way up the coast. Uh, but it's there and, and it, it's still an example, an operating example of this. This ends in the 1960s. And if Ray Lichty is, is on this uh, presentation, he, uh, he's written about his ex involvement with the uh, selling off of these car ferries uh, from the Pear Marquette, the Spartan and the Badger to their, their new owners uh, when the CNO, BNO system decided it was time to, to get out of the maritime business in Lake Michigan. We did have one last stab uh, at rail uh, ferry boat operations. Again, a shortcut idea from uh, the twin ports in Lake Superior 
to Thunder Bay in Canada. Uh, this is the Incan Superior, and it ran between the twin ports of Duluth and Superior up to Thunder Bay, and it was designed to serve customers of the paper market. And uh, those boxcars you see, if you're a model railroader, you know those are the high cube boxcars that traditionally hold newsprint paper or rolls of paper. And that's what this, that's basically how it justified this, this boat's existence and its operations existence. It was a, a Canadian Pacific supported operation. And it ran between 74 and 92 before finally the, the paper market really just didn't justify the expense anymore. Uh, but that really was the last gasp of, of true car ferry service on the Great Lakes. Uh, let's think about it, you know, almost 100 years uh, between the two, two nations. It was quite impressive. Uh, one city that tends to get overlooked in car float operations. Oh, here comes another announcement. Hey, Okay, so I'm at the 15 minute mark and I got 10 slides left, so we're gonna be okay. Uh, Chicago is a city people don't think about with car ferry operations, but uh, the Erie uh, opted to go with that route because to be quite honest, they were the last guys to get in Chicago from the East and they had the worst routings. So to get to freight customers, uh, they could not build a new track in that area, either it was too expensive, the city wasn't going to play ball, or their comp competition had already taken the best spots, and they opted to start a freight lighter operation in 1913, uh, which made it into railway age. That's actually where these images are from. This is a 1917 issue of Railway Age. Uh, there's the float bridge. There's the lighters. There's the uh, tugboat with the car ferry, you know, they've got, they had a pretty interesting idea. Uh, now, granted, it did not succeed. They, they pulled the plug on it in 1936, but uh, it was the, you know, as, as, as the cowboy who jumped into the cactus said, it seemed to be the thing to do at the time. Uh, similar case for the Santa Fe in San Francisco. The Santa Fe was not a big player in the San Francisco market. That was pretty much dominated by the Southern Pacific, thanks to its long-standing presence dating back to the beginning of the Transcontinental Railroad as a Southern as the Central Pacific. Uh, Santa Fe used a car ferry operation in San Francisco Harbor uh, to connect Port Richmond with other uh, freight terminals. And again, they were the last folks in. It wasn't necessarily the best uh, option they had, but it's what they had, that's what they could do. And it worked. It wasn't pretty. It didn't make a lot of money, but it made them competitive. Now, uh, I did say I was going to mention two, uh, two other uh, high seas operations. Uh, the first is uh, the Alaska Railroad. Uh, this is from Alaska Rails. It's a fan site on the Alaska Railroad. Um, there is a regular railroad car ferry, and as you can see, truck ferry service between the lower 48 and Alaska from Seattle to Whittier. Uh, that is the Whittier provider. It is an, a, a car ferry operation that is owned by uh, or operates with the, the Alaska Railroad, and it is regular service. That's how the Alaska Railroad gets its freight, and that's how it moves freight between the U.S. Uh, lower 48 and Alaska. Uh, it is regular service. It still runs to this day. Uh, and until that uh, long talked about rail bridge in Canada that's going to go up the Yukon gets built, uh, I expect that will be the only way to effectively transfer freight cars uh, between those two railroad systems. The second uh, maritime high seas operation is in the Caribbean and the Gulf. Uh, Florida East Coast used to run a, uh, a rail line to Cuba. 
And uh, for those of you who may not be familiar, Cuba was a significant source of American sugar. And in fact, Hershey uh, Chocolates had a significant operation there, uh, various fruit companies uh, and sugar concerns had, had significant operations there that generated a lot of freight. And Florida East Coast from uh, Port of Palm Beach uh, ran regular car ferry service on a maritime ferry. And you can see it was built for, you know, real ocean going service uh, between 1915 and 1940. Uh, now, West India Fruit uh, and Steamship is going to take, or West India Steamship is going to take over after 1940. And, you know, that traffic is going to uh, kind of go away by 1961. Uh, thanks to some uh, regime change in Cuba. But uh, that was a long standing operation uh, there. There was also C train, which went from New York and New Jersey to Cuba. And uh, rather than roll the cars onto and off of their ships, they lifted them. Uh, if you think about containerized freight these days, they were the pioneers. And in fact, they had tried uh, to get into that market early on before they went into bankruptcy uh, in 1981. Uh, again, they got crippled when the uh, Cuban market uh, went away and uh, they tried Puerto Rico and that didn't really work out. Uh, Mexico, there's a land connection, so it doesn't make much sense. Uh, so it just didn't, they weren't able to survive uh, with rail connections, but Credit to them for a really cool idea. Uh, they started this in the 1930s, the idea of lifting uh, the cars on and off the ships. Uh, and there are some Berger images of this operation that unfortunately are really grainy that I opted not to put in, but I found that the Golier had some really nice shots to share. Now there is a Gulf of Mexico operation still in play today. And this is, this is really one of the last car ferry operations in existence. So you've got New York, Alaska, and uh, the CG Railway. This is the port of Mobile, Alabama. And they have two ferry, uh, two, uh, ferry boats that run uh, between uh, Mobile and Cotazacolo. I should have put a pronouncer in. Uh, Cotazacolo in Mexico. Uh, and that is a bottleneck break. Uh, operation. You know, they are looking at this as a way to get around the congestion of uh, the Rio Grande border uh, checkpoints uh, and the fact that Union Pacific, BNSF, KCS are pretty much have those operations running at capacity. So if you're CSX, Norfolk Southern, Canadian National, to a certain extent, Kansas City Southern, uh, and you want to kind of get around that and just drop the cars off in Mexico for immediate inspection at a port, uh, this is a good option. Uh, the downside is you can only move 115 cars at a time on these boats, but they're there. Uh, they, Gen Genesee and Wyoming thought that's a lucrative enough uh, operation to invest in. So uh, that's where they are. And they are operating to this day. Uh, they've been getting some pretty good coverage in the uh, uh, railroad magazines about it. Um, so we'll see what happens. Uh, interesting uh, to see if there's any talk about using that kind of idea to help alleviate the uh, intermodal bottlenecks uh, here uh, that we're experiencing today. If you uh, would like to learn more, uh, and I'm sorry I'm kind of rushing through, but literally it's 10 minutes before they close the building and kick me out. Uh, here's a brief bibliography and I can uh, share this with anyone who wants it. Uh, if you're looking for a more specific topic, just let me know and uh, you can email me directly uh, and we'll have the contact information at the end of this on the video. Uh, and I'm happy to utilize the Berger collections. If we don't have it here, I probably know who's got it or where to find it uh, or who to talk to. But uh, thank you for your time. We've got about five minutes before they really start getting antsy about me being in here. So if anyone has questions, I'm happy to take them. And Tom Keller, Father Keller gave me an update. The Badger is undergoing hull inspection. So that the Badger may be back in, into service very, very soon. Uh, the Spartan, I know, has is, is been out of service for a while, so um, its fate is unclear, but probably not good. So, Badger's being repainted. Okay, great. Thank you, Bradley. So, I'm happy to entertain questions that come up. Um, you can feel free to chat.
uh, or uh, you can uh, activate your microphone to, uh, to ask. There is another Lake Michigan car ferry at Mass. Yes, there's a, there's a couple of them that have been preserved. Um, and uh, I'm glad to see that because it was a very interesting operation. And when you think about the amount of time it saved going through Chicago, uh, it was a really, really slick idea to, to you know, build those terminals and do that. Okay, well, again, thank you all for uh, giving us part of your Saturday to enjoy our presentations. And I'd like to thank again, Dave Jump and Father Tom Keller for their time in uh, delivering these really great presentations to us uh, for the library. Uh, this is probably gonna be the last one we do quarterly um, with the uh, improvement in access to the building on campus. Uh, we, we, we will probably be dialing this back in, in favor of more in-person events again, uh, which we like. And here comes the five-minute warning. The library warning. will close in five minutes. The library will close in five minutes. So uh, I look forward to seeing you at the library. If anyone does have reference questions, uh, feel free to let us know. And uh, if you do want to come by and use the collections, uh, we highly recommend contacting us ahead of time so we can make sure we've got everything you need uh, on site and nobody wastes a trip. But uh, thank you all again. And I hope you have a great rest of your weekend and a wonderful week. And you should expect to see links to YouTube for these videos within the next 24 to 48 hours. So thanks again. Have a good one.